expression. I love crappy romantic comedies. Yeah, yeah, it's a cliche. I can't help it. I love them. All those movies have that scene, you know? The girl is at her wit's end. She's been crying her eyes out. Her makeup is running. She looks like a zombie. She's done. Which is when Ryan Gosling knocks on her door to coax her out. Miss. Ah, shit. That sounds nothing like Ryan Gosling. See, <laughs> this is the problem with my life in a nutshell. It's not romantic, and it's certainly not a comedy. All right, where am I? What happened? Oh, yeah, the hospital. I felt woozy, and then oof, really, really hot, and I guess that I fainted. Ah, well, dropped to the restroom floor like a sack of potatoes. No better place for a nap. Are you okay, miss? Oh, shit, the doctor. And that's putting it mildly. I'll be all right, though. Um, are you sure? Aha, uh -huh, as if I could be sure of anything. Still, I should probably update my guardian angel. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe there's something I know for sure. If I have to spend one more second lying on this filthy floor, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to vomit. Uh, vomit again, I guess. I'm just a, a little nauseous, is all. I just had a little bit of a moment. A big moment. But it's over now. Uh, sorry, I ducked out. Uh, I'm already feeling much, much better. I can hardly tell her the truth, can I? Most people don't actually want you to be honest with them. Oh, I apologize, Dr. Giagana. I just vomited up my breakfast. I had it all over my chin. It wasn't a good look. It's hardly my fault. I haven't been handling stress very well lately. I guess it depends on what qualifies as lately, hmm? If we could take it to mean anything from yesterday to... the day I was born, then I'm not lying. Let's just say that... It's even more true now. Anyway, this isn't about me. I'll be out in just a second. Those weren't here before. Do you think they have any idea where they are? I'm sure this comes as a shock, but it is crucial that you understand the situation. Your mom had a brain aneurysm. Do you know what that means? Mom. <laughs> Funny. I could never get myself to call her mom. She's always been married to me. As I understand it, it's a weakened artery wall? Correct. And that artery ruptured, which caused a hemorrhage. It is a serious situation. We need to prepare for whatever happens next very quickly indeed. I've watched enough Grey's Anatomy to know that this is not good. Serious? I, uh, what can I do? Anything related to medical care will be my team's responsibility. But you are her trusted advocate. I, I'm so sorry, you should be her what now? Do, do you not remember? This is the reason we called you. We have your name and your number, which means that you signed the release. I have no idea what she's talking about. And since she is not able to express her will, it falls to you to speak on her behalf. But I presume you discussed that when you went through the process. So you must know that there are a number of options to consider. I don't believe it! She put my name on the form without asking me! She must have forged my signature! It's hardly a surprise, she's always done that kind of stuff. But I'm not making any important decisions! The phone call from the hospital, that was a surprise. I'd never have thought anything so serious would happen to her. Anyway... When she's back on her feet, she's going to have a good laugh about this. <laughs> the idea of me deciding on her behalf. Although, that's just a figure of speech, huh? I can't remember the last time I saw Marie laugh. <laughs> Actually, I do. When she read my first screenplay in high school. The passion with which she disregarded my work was always amazing to me. <laughs> she almost died laughing that day. <laughs> and the saddest part... She was right. It totally sucked. I'm sorry, miss. Miss Fortin. 
Demange. I... Uh, I went back to my maiden name. I'm sorry, that wasn't in your file. Listen, I understand that this is all very sudden, but we don't have a lot of time. We need to focus. We do indeed. I'm sorry, it's just the... It's okay. I understand. It's not an easy situation. Our major concern right now is the hemorrhage is spreading. There's the risk of a cerebral vasospasm. That is a complication which could severely affect her brain. Is... is she going to die? We're doing our best to make sure that doesn't happen. But there could be long-term consequences. This sort of event severely impacts the body, and mental functions may also be impaired. I need to know if you and your mother will be able to deal with that sort of complication. No, it can't be! Holy... Fucking... Shit. I'm not ready for this. What do you mean? To be completely frank, if we're able to pull your mother through this, there's only a small chance she'll be like she was before. Small? How small? Smaller than that. In all probability, she will never be quite the same. Some people would prefer not to keep living under such circumstances. They'd rather their medical care were geared more around letting go as gracefully as possible. What I need to know is, what would your mother want? I don't know how to answer that. Last time she told me she wanted something, it was... To be in MoMA. Excuse me? MoMA, the museum in New York. Miss Demange, I... Wait, your mother's that Marie Demange? The artist? Ah, there it is. Works every time. Once people figure out who Marie is, snap! Their whole demeanor changes. They feel like they know her somehow. Of course, they're completely wrong. Oh, she takes them in with her dog and pony show. But there's a world of difference between who she is in public and in private. And if this doctor knew Marie, the real her, she would realize how ridiculous her question is. Yeah, the Marie de Mange. And I'm her assistant, I guess. I handle the business, the management, the press. So that she can be fully dedicated to her art, you see? Anyway, uh, the other day, I, I got a call from Centre Pompidou. They want to do a retrospective on her life and work. Can you imagine? The, the billboards, the crowds, the press, the whole shebang. And I'm like, hell yeah! I hop into my car, I rush over to tell her, I run into the workshop, yelling, and you know what she said? Uh, did you hear from Mama? Ugh! Someone had told her they were considering her self-portrait eight, a canvas from her latest series. A whole exhibit in Paris, on the other hand, she didn't care. So, that's my mother. Most of the time, I don't know. I have no idea what she wants. I know what I'm asking isn't easy. I can give you a little time to think. Like that would change anything. I, uh, yeah, I suppose I need to think about it. I'm sorry, I, I gotta go. <sighs> I know what she'd say, that I'm running away again. What did she expect? <laughs> that I just show up and what? Decide whether uh, oh, she lives or she dies? supposed to make it to the end of the day, let alone...
I remember. Diane and I found an injured bird in the backyard. It was tiny. I think it was around the time Marie had set up her new studio in the sunroom. Now that I think of it, that was also my first experience with death. In fact, I also had a really weird dream that night. Something about that day always seemed off. I never figured out why. And why am I thinking about this now? Do you recognize it? This is the mobile that Marie made me before I was born. It's exquisite and delicate. I loved it. And you did too. I think I still have it in a box somewhere. I think I saw a big shadow moving down the hallway that night. I imagined a monster bird was visiting us. For a long time, I thought it was just a strange dream. Back then, Marie wasn't very well known, but she was hardworking. She had just started a series on birds, actually. They were all over the house. She considered them a symbol. A postmodern symbol of anti-anthropic levity. <laughs> Classic Marie. Marie was always quite passionate about birds. So I suggested we keep this one as a pet once it got better. I could already imagine it. A beautiful cage tucked in the corner of the studio. She got so mad. At the time, I didn't understand why she reacted like that. But now... Marie told us she'd take care of the bird, so we went back to playing. I never saw it again. And when I asked what happened, she said it just flew away. I was so relieved. The nest was high up in the tree, but the wind blew it down. The bird was obviously young. It was a big fall. It must have been badly hurt. I didn't realize it at the time. Ha, <laughs> yeah, Diane was so proud of packing her own suitcase. Her father came to pick her up that afternoon. She spent the weekend with him and her stepsister. I was a bit jealous but also happy to have some time with my mother, just us. Now I know for certain that someone was in the backyard that night. And since Diane was at her father's, it must have been Marie. What was she doing out there? Maybe... Maybe Marie killed the bird. That's what she was doing out there in the middle of the night, burying it in secret. And it might sound strange, but I also understand why she did it.
Marie is really an astonishing person, you know. She's usually hard, but also she could be vulnerable sometimes. She couldn't stand seeing the bird injured. She knew it would never recover. It was too weak. I remember she said, not being able to fly, that's no life for a bird. She thought it would be better off dead. She could have just abandoned it, let things run their course. But I don't think she did. I think she killed it with her own hands. Sounds cruel, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's just Marie. That's her outlook on life. She's all or nothing. What I need to know is, what would your mother want? I'm not ducking out. Not this time. After all, isn't this what Marie wanted? I... I think... My legs are shaking. Maybe I'm having another turn. I think I need a sugary drink. Understood. Do you need anything? Well, I need more coffee. But if I drink another one, my stomach is going to declare war on the rest of me. I... I just can't speak on my mom's behalf. One thing's for sure. She's a radical. She's all or nothing. All the time. I understand. It's hard to contemplate the idea of living with a disability. It's not that, not at all. If we were talking about me or, or, or someone else, I would say, it's gonna be fine. You adapt, people do it all the time. They have to. Life's too important. I would say that. She wouldn't. I'm not sure that answers your question. She certainly comes across as rather f forthright. You don't say. I've seen her on TV a couple of times. My father loves her. She's an extraordinary artist. In her interviews, she's so impressive, fierce even. It must be quite something to be the, the, the daughter of someone so talented. I've heard this one before. That's a polite way to say, it can't be easy to have a nutcase for a mother. Yes, it's quite an experience. <laughs> Doctor, I... Do we know why? Why this happened? We were just having dinner last night. She was... She was fine. She, there she... could be a lot of factors. Family history, hypertension, alcohol consumption. I did have a pretty severe hangover this morning. Even past trauma, like a historic head injury. It's hard to say right now. Ah. All right, Miss Demange, I'll give you time to think. Let's speak again in about two hours, if that works for you. Uh, sounds good. Uh, can I see her? Yes, of course. Let me find out her room number. I know what I have to do, what I should do. It wasn't that long ago that I could write this kind of scene without breaking a sweat. I step into the room, there'll be tubes everywhere, beeping sounds. The audience will know that it's serious. Then I start bawling my eyes out. I collapse on my mom's bed, pouring out snot from my nose. Or maybe I'll be dignified. Stony-faced, standing quietly in the corner. Close up on my face, they'll see I'm suffering. Deep inside, a single tear rolls down my cheek. That's exactly how it will happen. Or what should happen. There's just one problem. I really must. She probably needs me. I don't know why, but I can't open that door.
It's always stressful to share an elevator with a stranger. Still, it could be worse. Hey, Junie. I could have to share it with my sister. Okay, I'm kidding. We love each other. Love giving each other a hard time. Okay, I love giving her a hard time. <laughs> For instance. Hey, Didi Do. Nothing? I haven't eaten yet. My, my blood sugar's low, okay? Come with me to the cafeteria. Okay. But if you utter that stupid nickname one more time, I'll strangle you. There it is. She had me worried for a sec. Oh, this food looks nasty. Did you notice? Jan loves being in charge. She wasn't always like that. It started when she was a teenager. Some people get acne, she got authority. So, how's work? Ah, oh, you know, uh, scheduling, phone calls, spreadsheets. It's mind-numbing. There's no time to think. That's why I love it so much. How's your script coming along? Oh, uh... I never should have told her about it. I guess I had a moment of weakness. I thought she would worry less about me if she knew I was working on something creative. But why did I even think she was worrying about it in the first place? She doesn't seem worried now. Better change the subject. And how are you? Well, since you ask... <sighs> so easy. I was doing good, until yesterday. <laughs> One of my idiot patients up and groped my ass. She's a physical therapist, working with professional athletes. She spends her days massaging pretty boys with two brain cells and zero self-control. She's the best in her field, I've heard. All the major soccer clubs are fighting over her. Probably because she has her own story, she almost became a tennis pro at 17 years old. She was really strong. And then there was some pff, kerfuffle. I don't know what happened, but the league didn't have her back, so she just gave it all up. I've never seen her so angry. Though today's a close second. I wonder what happened to that guy who was stupid enough to grope her. What happened? I handled it with poise, aplomb, and composure. Anyway, he has a broken hand now. Good thing he plays soccer, not volleyball. The worst part is, she's not joking. In other news, this place is so stressful. Everyone's way too nice. It is a hospital, Jan. I know. They should be scowling 24-7. So? How is she? Um, I haven't been to see her yet. What are you waiting for? A singing telegram? Sorry, that was uncalled for. This whole situation, it's just... a lot. Yeah? Sounds like there's something else. Something else bothering you? No, nothing else. Wanna bet that there's something else? Well, I guess, um... I did meet with the doctor this morning. She told me about your deal between mom and you, and to be honest, I was shocked. Were you going to tell me at some point? Ugh, see? I knew that this whole trusted advocate thing would never fly. The only question is, will she believe me when I tell her I didn't know? Given the state she's in, I wouldn't bet on it. Look, I'm sure you're upset. Of course I'm upset. We just found out that mom might die. Does that mean nothing to you? It does. Uh, of course it does. Uh, but it's okay. I'm handling it. You know, I'm perfectly capable of making this decision. Just leave it to me this time. What's going on, June? I'm sorry? Something's wrong. Uh, could be the grapefruit. I read somewhere that it's really toxic. And, no, uh, it's not the grapefruit. I don't recognize you. You're different. Ooh, she wants to talk. Seriously. <laughs> That's just her way to cope with stress. She needs to dissect things to understand them. And she needs to understand things in order to control them. So, what's the play? 
Idiots or goldfish? Maybe if I say nothing, she'll leave me alone? And don't pretend you can't hear me. I guess I can't get out of this one. You're acting like... like some kind of robot. You're all closed off. And you clearly aren't considering how I feel about all this. Uh, what's the game here? Where's the Jan I know? She's got some nerve lecturing me as though nothing happened. I'm not gonna lie, she's not entirely wrong. I haven't exactly been brimming over with empathy recently. It's not my fault, you know, it just makes it easier to get through the day. For me, at least. I'm not sure how anyone else manages. Okay, maybe I am a little bit distant, but have you thought about my situation? See? That's exactly the problem. And, okay, this is going to make me sound like, like a huge asshole yet again, but... I'm used to that. I've been meaning to talk to you about this, so... So why not do it now? We're here for Mom. And, and you can see how hard this is on me. A and yet, here we are, yet again, talking about you. What happened to you was awful. It really was. Absolutely horrible. But that was five years ago. It can't be five years. It can't be five years. It can't be five years. It was only yesterday. Why the hell is she bringing this up, anyway? <gasps> Where are you going with this? I, I don't really know. I guess I'm a little worried about you. I don't understand what goes on in your head and... <sighs> And that scares me. Why are you like this? Really? She's worried about me? You had to go there, didn't you? You, you really, you can't help yourself. W whenever you can't control something, you just hate it, don't you? And so, pow, you attack. You're wrong, Jun. I'm just trying to help. You, you can't really tell me that everything's fine, can you? Do you think that throwing my little problems back in my face is going to help? Oh, wonderful! Wow! Oh, it's a miracle! I'm cured! Thanks for the therapy session, but I really have to go. Obviously, uh, you can handle everything just fine on your own, so go ahead and take care of Marie. Wait, June! Don't leave, please! I'm sorry. I really need you. I... <clears throat> Really, I'm a dumbass. She really is a dumbass. <sighs> Should I be honest? Mm, do I have to? I just grabbed the first opportunity to put up a stink so I could get the hell out of there. Of course I'm weird. And I can see how that might freak her out. She wasn't telling me that because she cares. That was her lashing out to hurt me. Oh, what? You know, Astrid, memory is weird. You suddenly remember these moments without knowing why. For instance, one day I, I visited a fishery. This was a year or two ago. I was writing the script for a promotional documentary about lobsters, a freelance gig for the Agricultural Chamber of Brittany. Truly the crowning moment of my career. Although for real, I, I loved writing it. It felt good. Going outside, meeting people. 
Lobsters are fascinating animals. Shall I tell you what I remember? Loves lobsters. Their exquisite and delicate flesh is prized by the finest gourmets. With a little garlic butter, lemon, or mayonnaise, they're delicious. They're on every great chef's menu. Lobsters are a symbol of wealth and luxury. Lobsters are a mystery to science because they don't age. Their cells replace themselves perfectly, which allows them to never stop growing throughout their lives. Female lobsters may lay over 100,000 eggs in their lifetime. They keep each clutch underneath their tails for several months, and when the eggs finally hatch, out come a profusion of lava just a few millimeters long. Can you imagine? Over 100,000 tiny little astrites. Lobsters have a chitinous exoskeleton, a durable and tensile material that protects them fully. This natural barrier is so strong that lobsters have no natural predators. In short, no one can mess with lobsters. Except humans, of course. That was the official line. The one I got paid to write. But I dug deeper. You can call me a lot of things, but I'm nothing if not conscientious. I learned a lot about lobsters that the Agricultural Council wouldn't have approved of. Ugly truths we'd rather hide. Female lobsters may lay over 100,000 eggs in their lifetime, but few will reach adulthood. The lava will be gobbled up by passing wildlife. The young ones will be poisoned by water pollution. Their livers filled with heavy metals and microplastics. And those who grow big enough will be plucked out of the sea by humans to end up on a fishmonger's stall. Lobsters have a chitinous exoskeleton. But sometimes they feel trapped in it, so they molt. They leave their shells behind and expose themselves. Until their skin hardens again, the world is full of predators. Carnivorous fish, other arthropods, and humans, of course. Because when they've just molted, when they're soft, lobsters are their tenderest and their tastiest. Lobsters don't age, but after a while, their shells do. And if they can't make a new one, their current shell will wear out. It will split. Bacteria, fungi, and other diseases might seep in through these cracks. And then the lobster will rot from the inside. Everyone loves lobsters. But to truly love them, first you have to cook them. And to cook them, you have to kill them. There are two ways, traditional or modern. The traditional way is to chuck lobsters into boiling water. Alive. And wait. Their flesh burns, the air bubbles beneath their shell expand and burst their organs. It's horrible. Lobsters don't want to die. But the people who love them don't care about that.
All this to say, being fake, writing pretty lies, that doesn't bother me. Between my clerical work for Marie and those PR gigs, I learned to tune it out. No one wants to know what's in my head, but maybe you do? Lobsters have a chitinous exoskeleton that limits their growth. As soon as they shed it, they're in danger. Their enemies notice their weakness. They can smell it, like sharks smell blood. If they can reach a weakened lobster, they'll devour it. They'll tear it apart and feast on its flesh. I don't want to be eaten. Lobsters don't age. In fact, they could never die at all. If they just stayed in their holes, they'd never get sick. They'd never get harvested or trapped. Unfortunately, lobsters grow. Maybe that's the big difference between them and me. Everyone loves lobsters, and that love is what's killing them. If no one loved them, we'd let lobsters live happily at the cold bottom of the ocean. Lobsters don't need to be loved. Me neither, to be honest. Female lobsters may lay over 100,000 eggs in their lifetime, and they'll never watch them grow up. You might think that the sea is salty from all the tears shed by lobster mothers, but they don't cry. What good would all that sorrow do? You know, Astrid, memory is weird. You suddenly remember these moments without knowing why, until you realize it's trying to teach you something crucial. That day, I learned that I needed to be stronger than a lobster, to never molt, to never get eaten, to just hide in my hole, to never cry. That's the only way that I could keep on living after you died, my little fawn. I don't want anything. I don't expect anything. I feel nothing. Why are you like this? She's right. I have been weird lately. Honestly, I'm glad she noticed. You're right. I am? Because I was starting to think that I was just being a dumbass. Oh, you're totally a dumbass. You can't just bring up Astrid's death out of the blue and throw it in my face. But you are right. With her gone, something inside me is broken. I just don't feel anything. Everything just slides off me. I'm... I'm Teflon. It's sealed off. Like a damn lobster. A lobster? And you're right. It's been five years already. But I'm still trying to figure out how the hell I'm meant to reconnect with my life. I understand. I mean, I know I can't understand, but... I think I get it. Is there anything I can do to help? I don't think so. Well, you can keep on beating up idiots, but that's more of a public service than for me, specifically. <laughs> I will. <laughs> you know, I admire you. <laughs> sure you do. You've always been the sensitive one. That's classic Marie right there. I'm sensitive. By which he means weak. Not strong enough for the world. Obviously I pale in comparison to the formidable Diane. Yep, that's me. So fragile. That's not what I mean. 
Mom raised us to bite before we get bitten. That was the only way out she could see. And I guess I took her literally. But you weren't like that. You knew how to listen. You got people. You were less scared of them. I always loved that about you. Uh, that's new. What the hell do I say to that? That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Yeah, right. Knock it off. I don't know why it's so difficult for us to just talk. Maybe this is why Mom chose you. And we're back. Are you bitter right now? <laughs> certainly not. Uh, certainly. No. I mean, you are bitter. You're you're pouting. Look at your fucking enough. face. Okay, stop it. This isn't the time. I just don't get it. What is there to get? You know, Marie, she's unpredictable. Wait, you mean you didn't know? Well, you should see what my signature looks like on the form. Oh, she's the worst. Why would she do that? I have no idea. I guess she thought it made sense since I handled the rest of her paperwork. Unless she thought I was a perfect fit since I'm a Libra with Pisces rising or whatever. All right, but still, it's a big responsibility. And it's a bit weird to ask you, of all people, to make that decision. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Scream in the middle of the hospital cafeteria? That's not my style. Although, the way this day is going, it might become my style. You can be pretty clumsy. You can't cook a meal without setting the house on fire. Et voila. I'm never going to live that down, am I? Depends. Have you figured out a safe way to brown-baked Alaska yet? <sighs> Whatever. <sighs> this isn't the time to rehash all that. Really, I don't get it. This is so important. Why would she trust you over me? All right, I've had enough. You know what? You're right. Only an idiot would trust me. Oh, come on. Yeah, here it comes. You're the reliable one, aren't you? The one people can always count on. What are you talking about? Ugh, I'm out of here. I'd probably just trip over her ventilator or something. We wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? No, you're being ridiculous, you know. Please, sit down. I didn't mean to upset you. Oh, you didn't? Well, you got that wrong. Uh. Well, that was embarrassing, wasn't it? Uh, I just can't help it. So Mum wrote my name instead of hers on a worthless paper. What does it matter? Dan and I are stuck in this stupid competition. I hate it. I feel I can't escape it. Oh, <laughs> Uh, of course I'd remember that day. My infamous 25th birthday. The day we met Jan's girlfriend. The day we danced a little, ate a little, and drank too much. But most of all, the day everyone went home early because... I set the kitchen on fire while making dessert. There's plenty about that night I never told Dian. I wasn't expecting Marie to have a present for me, and yet she remembered. It was a bottle of Japanese whiskey as old as I was, 25 years of age. But as usual with Marie, things couldn't just be nice. I hope you like it, because it costs me a fortune. That's what she said when she handed me the bottle. 
she could afford it too. She wasn't world famous yet, but her career was taking off, and with that, her taste became more and more luxurious. Me? Oh, I was light years away from all of that. I hate whiskey. I hated it then, I hate it now. That's how it works with Marie. Even when she does something for Jan and I, in the end, it's always about her. It was the first time Diane introduced us to her girlfriend. Her very first girlfriend. She didn't make a big deal of it. She didn't even tell me that she would have a guest. But I knew it was important to her. And neither Marie nor myself reacted appropriately. She rushed over to hug them both. I don't think I'd ever seen my mother so excited. Then she congratulated Diane for her rejection of patriarchally mandated heteronormativity. Diane didn't say anything, but I could see she was upset. Her intimacy had just been reduced to activism somehow, and I wasn't there to support her. I was furious. It's stupid, I know, but I wanted to enjoy my party, and she showed up with something important to share. All of a sudden, my 25th birthday seemed trite, unimportant. Her girlfriend was called Sasha. She was nice, intuitive, smart, and very pretty. I was quite reluctant to organize this party. It was the last birthday I would celebrate at Marie's. Your dad and I were about to move in together, so I wanted to make it special impress my mother, earn her respect, maybe even her admiration. But that would only happen if everything were perfect. The fire made it a complete failure. But to be honest, she'd have found some problem anyway. Jen always loved being the center of attention. But when she showed up with her hair cut short and dyed green, I almost didn't recognize her. 19 years strong on this earth, and she couldn't care less about people's opinions. She was amazing to me. But I wonder if she was, at least unconsciously, trying to please Marie. It worked, by the way. Marie always had a soft spot for the rebels, and contempt for the rest. I don't think it made Jan any happier, though. I was so stressed out that night that I started drinking early. Marie loves to drink, so does Diane, and her girlfriend Sasha followed along. Long story short, we got drunk fast. All four of us. We had booze, we had cigarettes, plus the other stuff. I don't have to tell you everything. And after a while, Diane was completely out. She could barely stand. When dinner started, Marie turned on the charm. She laughed loudly, talked a lot, asked all kinds of questions. She has the most unbelievable charisma when she's trying to please someone, you know? And that night, she really was trying. I thought it was odd. She certainly wasn't doing it for me, or for Diane. And then I noticed the way she was looking at Sasha. I saw the glimmer in her eyes. The same as when she talks about Japanese whiskey. And I got worried. Alex called several times that night. He wanted to know how things were going. He had a hunch things would be tense, and he wanted to be my emotional hotline. I didn't answer. I wanted to fend for myself. <laughs> it's why I didn't invite him in the first place. I'll admit, sometimes his support was stifling. I'd got these nice candles to decorate the table with. Obviously, I burned myself when lighting them. To no one's surprise, that was typical me. Scavus, they called me. It means clumsy in Latin. Marie coined that one. I didn't mind. Quite the contrary. In any family, everyone plays a role. You just need to find the one that suits you. And 
I like being the bumbling, fumbling one. That way, at least, the pressure was off. So, yes, Jen and I were trapped in this ridiculous rivalry. The choir girl versus the rebel. The meek versus the indomitable. I'm never taken seriously. She's not allowed to show any sign of weakness, and we hold it against each other. But as soon as we lower our guard, we are saddled with the obvious. It's become more intense as we grew in Mary's shadow. We care about each other more than anyone else. The flames went up very high, very quickly. Everyone ran into the kitchen. Marie, Diane, and Sasha. Oh, she screamed at me. She couldn't believe that anyone could be so inept. I said it was an accident. I was trying to brown the baked Alaska, but it got out of hand. No one questioned my version of events. The whole thing was just classic me. Alex wasn't there to defend me, and I just sucked it up. I never saw Sasha after that day. She and Diane broke up a few weeks later. Maybe I was just drunk. Maybe I was imagining things. Maybe I was paranoid. But when Marie invited Sasha to her studio to see the paintings and more, oh, that raised the flag. She was up to something. She was trying to seduce her. And maybe she could have. I tried to warn Diane, told her to watch out. She was too far gone. I had to do something, but I couldn't face Marie head on. I wasn't strong enough, so... I improvised. No one noticed the bottle of Japanese whiskey was completely empty. Alcohol burns nicely on the stove. It was perfect for me to craft a diversion. And you know what? I wasn't even that drunk. I was mostly angry at Marie, at myself at my inability to confront her face to face. Maybe nothing happened after all. Maybe Marie didn't try anything. I'll never know. But I was scared enough for Jan's relationship that I set the kitchen on fire. I never told Jan what happened. She still thinks I'm a bumbling idiot. I can't tell her the truth, and she wouldn't want to hear it anyway. But what I did that night, I did out of love. Marie always said that you can't trust anyone in life. Well, in that moment, whether she knew it or not, Jan could trust me. Why would she trust you over me? And here we go again, trying to see who can spit the furthest. But you know what? I'm not playing this game. She needs her sister today, not a fight. You know, I get it. Get what? Why you think of me this way? <laughs> the chump who keeps screwing things up? I never... I understand because that's my little routine, you know? What are you saying? What's wrong with me? I'm not about to tell her all my dirty secrets. That wouldn't be like me at all. Although I guess this is a pretty good day for confessions. <sighs> it's not easy existing between Marie and you. Between the overbearing artist and her gifted little go-getter. <laughs> so I figured if I played the klutzy did, I wouldn't need to compete with either of you. If I'm so gifted, why the hell did I choose this grapefruit? This thing's disgusting. <laughs> That's my Didi do. Open your heart a tiny bit and she gets all uncomfortable. I told you it's toxic! Understand this. We both know things can be tense between us. 
It would be easier if I could act like this is all her fault. Jan's competitive spirit is unmatched. She has to be the first in everything. It can make her a little stupid sometimes. Oh, just like when she was training for tennis, or when we did hamster races. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Racing hamsters. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> we had these hamsters for a while. We won them at the village fair. Marie hated them, but we were allowed to keep them as long as they were out of her sight. And Jan always wanted to race them. Hers was really slow. It lost every race. It was an embarrassment. Uh, she had this whole training regimen, but it wasn't enough. So she brought out the big guns. And one day, her hamster was hyped to the max. Absolutely smoked mine. And that night, he died. It wasn't hard to get the truth out of her. She'd fed him coffee drops. She was kind of sad, but not really. At least he went out on a win, she said. I could act like I wasn't anything like her, but that's not true. I just pretended that I didn't care. Truthfully, I also wanted to be the best. At the very least, I wanted to best her. As if we were always competing with each other, and it was exhausting. Some days it was hard, but whatever happened, I've always, always tried to protect you. I don't need anyone's protection. Yeah, it sounds weird when I say it out loud. You're the strongest person I know. <laughs> and you're built like a sea cucumber. <sighs> Look, all I'm saying is... I was always on your side when it mattered. Are you talking about mom right now? Not just her. Yeah, I'm totally talking about Marie. I'm talking about the fact that... You're my sister, and that's special to me. And I know it's the same to you. Listen, Diane, I have no idea how things are going to play out with Marie. And it's true, I have been feeling out of it for a little while now. But I do know one thing that's going to help us. What do you mean? I mean that being a psychopathic robot has its perks. Cool heads prevail. And I think this is going to help us make the right choice. The best choice for Marie, sure. But for you and me, too. Maybe. Why are you looking at me like that? It's just... I'm not used to seeing you like this. You sound confident. It suits you. All right. So, what do we do? I have no idea. But I'm not going to tell her that right now. I need to find a different tack. You know your mother. She's stubborn. A real trooper. So, I think we will have to wait and see. I can't. No, I, I just can't. I'm not going to sit here twiddling my thumbs. We don't have a choice, Jen. <laughs> of course we do. We need to stay on top of the doctors. They need to do their absolute best. Come to think of it, we're not keeping her in this hole. I'll call my dad. I'll bet he'll have a buddy in a private clinic somewhere. We're not leaving anything to chance. Why aren't you saying anything? You're with me, right? We need to fight, don't we? I don't know, Jan. What do you mean, I don't know, Jan? If, if we were in her place, you know very well what she'd be doing. She'd do everything in her power to make sure we pulled through. We owe her that as well, don't we? I can't take any more illusions of control. You can't always do something, you know? Running around all over the place, yelling at doctors won't help her just because we think it will. It doesn't work that way. It never does. Sometimes you just need to let go. Let go? Uh, let go of what? See, Diane, maybe this is why Marie chose me. She knows that I can keep a cool head, that I don't let my emotions take over. Bullshit. You think this isn't your emotions doing the talking? You go on and on saying that mom is the worst mother ever. Do you seriously not think you share some of the blame? What? What do you mean? You know very well what I mean. She could have died in that car. Marie was also in the car that day. 
You remember my little phone? I can't remember why. She was going to town for an errand, I think. I parked in front of her house. She sat in the front, and then... She was by my side when I woke up in the hospital. Jan's right. Marie could have died. And the doctor said that this sort of thing can happen due to trauma from years ago. So it's all my fault, then? Are you saying that? All of this is happening because of me? Of course not. But since the accident, she's given you work. She's done her best to help you. And you... you just want to let her die? Shit, I'm not going to give up on her. If you hate her, that's your problem. You're out of your damn mind. Oh, come on. You're so transparent. Shut up! I don't want to hear any more of this. I'm leaving. <sighs> damn it. Did I really have to go off like that? <sighs> Maybe she's right. Maybe we should fight. Just like Marie taught us. Do I really have to be so angry? Do I really hate my mother? When will Dad get here? He'll get here when he gets here. Soon. Don't worry. I can't wait. Tomorrow we're visiting Buckingham Palace, and Lizzie says I'll get to taste real fish and chips and... Oh, sorry, Junon. I've never really been jealous of Diane's family. I was too fascinated by the concept of a family. That was an incredible discovery for me, and so beautiful to see. I was also worried for her. She had a dad and a stepsister. She had something to lose. I only had Marie, and Marie is immortal. So I was safe. Why do you put the elastic bands around their claws? Is it so they don't cut your fingers? <laughs> I appreciate the concern, but no, ma'am. Uh, without the bands, they would just eat each other. When the guy said that, my mind jumped to my mother. She used to warn me about people and how dangerous they could be. Even me, she said. Don't trust me. Trust no one but yourself. Oh, it was exhausting. Wow, I'd forgotten how muscular you are. <laughs> and? Are you jealous? No, I like it. Uh, all right, you know, you're my sister. This is super embarrassing, especially since you're drunk off your ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've always found Jan's presence comforting. She only has to stand by me and I start to breathe easier. Funny, 
and you forget the obvious stuff as time goes by. You see, my little dear, there are some things I'd have loved the chance to tell you. For starters, growing up means figuring out what you really care about and what you're better off without. I never understood why the whole world was such a threat to Marie. It damaged me growing up that way. Now, I've had enough. Jan has always been a reassuring presence in my life. Although I never knew how to tell her, we had completely different lives. We're not affected by the same things, but I hope it's not too late to tell her that I care about her. We owe her that as well, don't we? She's terrified, actually. My little sister, I need to comfort her. Show her that I'm here for her. That she's not alone. You know what? Right about now, there's nothing we can do for Marie. Nothing at all. But I... I know this bothers you, and I understand. But that's how it is. It's out of our control. So I'd rather pay attention to what matters the most. Family. And that's what exactly? It's you. You're my family, Jen. What about mom? Marie is different. That's just how she is. She's... Sure, we're part of her life. But we can't expect much more than that. Marie... She's alone against the world. Mm, I think she'd be furious if she knew she was surrounded with Jesus stuff. Oh, she's a staunch atheist. Pretty much an old-school iconoclast. The opposite of her mother, who was a real Bible thumper from what little I know of her. Hence, the biblical first name. After all, whether she admits it or not, Mom has one thing in common with the biblical Mary. Both of them had a child whose father was shrouded in mystery, which makes me baby Jesus? I'd prefer not to end up dead on a cross, though. Mm. Considering what she's been through. As a kid, I mean. What is she talking about? What are you talking about? How do you know what she went through as a kid? Did she talk to you? Once. One night. I didn't really understand. Her dad left when she was like 12 years old. She basically raised her brothers and sisters on her own. Hold on, what? She has brothers and sisters? I guess so. And she's the oldest. And at some point, she burned bridges with everyone. Forever. Oh, well. Did, did I know this? I kind of remember, but it feels like a blur. Have we talked about this before? Did I forget that too? Hmm. That's not what's important right now. You know, Jan, I don't think that Marie has anyone. Not really. She doesn't want to. She can't. She doesn't know how to trust. True. That is the one thing that's beyond her reach. But it's not beyond ours. We need to trust each other, otherwise we're screwed. You understand? Of course I understand. I've spent years trying to get her to pay attention to me. And I don't feel like fighting all the time. Not against you, anyway. We don't have to anymore. What? You mean, now that she's fucking dying? No, I mean, we can decide to do things differently. We don't have to play by her rules, where everyone's out for everyone. Kill or be killed. I think that's... I don't know. It might be her history, but it doesn't have to be ours. I'm not even sure she even believes it herself, actually. I'd rather believe that there are people I can always count on. And that they can count on me, because I love them, and I care for them. People like you, Didi Do. Is she... crying? Sorry. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm scared, you know? 
for mom. I don't want her to die. Well, right now, she's still alive. And you know her, she's not going down easy. I don't think you're anything like a lobster. I think lobsters are disgusting. Is that right? Me too, come to think of it. Ugh, oh, crap. What? Is it the doctors? No, look. Alex? You should answer. Are you sure? Are you gonna be okay? Ask me again and I'll slap you. Of course I'll be okay. You're coming right back, aren't you? You bet I am, deep. Little sis. I don't know what would have happened between your dad and I, if you were still here. Would we have agreed on how to raise you? The kind of values to impart? Respect others? Be curious and open-minded? And try to beautify the world? At your age, that mostly meant avoid picking your nose in public. I don't think we would have had any trouble getting along in the end. We were on the same wavelength. I trusted him 100% from the first day I met him. He's got that little something in his eyes. This uncanny kindness that's always there. God damn it, you know. Okay, pretend I didn't say anything, huh? Hello, Alex. How are you doing, Alex? Oh, I'm so glad to hear from you, Alex. Did you take it? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I know exactly what he's talking about. I just have no desire to talk about it right now. The house. Astrid's dollhouse. It used to be in my office, and now it isn't. And I need it for work. I'm using it as a reference for level design. Can I call you later? Hold on. Where am I right now? Hmm, I guess I wandered into a decommissioned part of the hospital. Ooh, it's kind of spooky. No, you cannot call me later. It's easy. Just tell me if you have it. It will take two seconds. Your dad is getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, but it's true. All right, Alex, listen. Okay, come on, keep your cool. Try and be mindful. I have no idea where that house is. And since we're talking about last week, actually, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have showed up unannounced. I don't know what came over me. What does that mean? Wasn't it nice to see each other again? You and I never got to talk about some stuff. The birds and bees, how grown-ups cuddle. Although we did have the chance. But I was never comfortable with the idea. Marie wasn't a fan of mother-daughter conversations. When I had my first period, do you know what she told me? Just make sure you don't stay in the couch. So, I guess as a result, I'm not too good with personal matters either. But still, I have a fond memory of that moment. I had become a woman, just like her. It was astonishing, almost an animalistic feeling. I felt strong, powerful. <sighs> it was very nice. But it was also completely stupid. Don't say that. Why are you saying that? You know why. We can't be doing this. Things are different between us now. They don't have to be. Things could even be better. Stop it. You know I'm right. Deep down you know it. Everything that happened to us, it helped us. There was a reason. Maybe all of this means we are supposed to come back together. Stronger. Bullshit. Why? What about Pauline? Pauline is... great. I'll talk to her. It will be hard, but she'll understand. What will she understand? That your crazy ex has suddenly decided to return after dumping you, after she killed your... Don't even go there. That's a really stupid idea, Alex. <laughs> People don't change. And you know how I am. I do. I've known since day one. We met in high school, as juniors. <laughs> it feels like a lifetime ago. We only had one class in common. Film studies. And we had completely opposite tastes. 
but I immediately liked something about him. His high-speed internet. Hey, back in the day, it was a precious gift, especially in our podunk town. All of a sudden, you could pirate movies from all over the world. A dream. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Piracy kills, blah, blah, blah. But that's only for the rich. When you're 16, you're poor, so it's okay. We spent hours on end in Alex's bedroom. I'm sure his parents thought we were having sex. Alex made an attempt once, but I wasn't interested at all at the time. I think that it scared me. Your dad didn't insist. That's one thing I like about him. Even as a teen, he was much less stupid than most guys. We watched tons of movies, lying on his bed, chomping on candy. I was obsessed with film. It felt like discovering a new world. And when I requested a boring three-hour movie, the next day, we would play a video game. Actually, it's not as lame as it sounds, I promise. Don't you think about it? Don't you miss it? Don't you want everything to be just like before? I think... Yes, I think I do. It's not too late. <sighs> you really think so? I know so. I'm on my way then. Like, now? Yes. Shouldn't I? Yes. Yes, come over. Wait for me, I'm coming. After all, why not? Maybe he's right. Maybe I was just wrong about all this. That wouldn't be the first time I screwed up. The three of us were so happy together. Maybe Alex and I can still be happy. Oh, wait. You know, my little phone, in life, you only have two ways out. Either escaping or disappearing. But sometimes you're unable to disappear. And escaping from yourself, well, that sure ain't easy. So, when that happens, in your opinion, what's left to do? We can try to find out together if you want. tell us bedtime stories. She would make up animal fables with all kinds of mystery and conflict. Savage world, she called it. Female wolves, bears, or scorpions would find themselves in imminent danger, but they could always manage it on their own, swindling and betraying the boorish, idiotic males. Marie wanted us to be strong, courageous, and independent women, except it also made me a bit fearful of the world. <laughs> Alex gifted me most of these books. It started as a joke. But as time passed, 
there were more and more. It goes back to the film studies days in high school. We barely knew one another. The teacher had prompted us to write a few scenes from a comedy. And I couldn't do it. And then one morning, your dad gave me a book and told me, check this out, since you're so not funny. <laughs> it made me laugh. And, uh, well, truth be told, I was charmed that he cared about me. So I read his dumb book. And uh, believe it or not, the next few scenes I wrote were really funny. <laughs> but then it turned into a habit. Every time I had an issue, Alex would find the book to address it. Some of the worst titles, too. Um, how to win friends and influence people. The subtle art of not giving a fuck. Uh, who moved my cheese? I was reading them casually, but they still helped me move on. Alex would call it the emergency library. <laughs> Every problem has a book, he said. But when I found myself alone, the library didn't work anymore. At first, I stayed in the apartment for days. I wouldn't go outside. I barely recognized my own voice when I opened the door for food deliveries. I could have disappeared. No one would have known. Yet, amid the silence, if you listen carefully, you can hear some things. The air traveling through the lungs, the bowels gurgling, the teeth grinding, even a heart beating. That much is clear now. In fact, Alex and Marie are like two sides of the same coin for me. Alex was my crutch, my unwavering support. I came to believe that I would crumble without him. Marie was a model of strength, of courage and determination. Everyone admires her, but she is completely unattainable. And I was dependent on her as much as him unable to manage on my own, but that was before. I guess you understand now, my little fawn. Your dad and I separated, and for the first time in my life, I was living alone at 34 years old. I had no idea how to do that, and he didn't fix everything, but Come to think of it, it may be the reason I began looking for who I really was. I lived surrounded with cardboard boxes for months. I was unable to open them. It was physically impossible, but it didn't bother me much. I've never been a homemaker anyway. Also, if I had an off day, I could always blame it on those boxes. Instead of blame it on the life that was put away in those boxes. I think I just figured out why I love movies so much. When I was a teenager, my life didn't seem real. I couldn't say for sure that I existed, but in movies, people had pure and intense emotions. I loved that. Any fiction was a documentary to me. When I found myself alone, I fell back into that zone. I watched hundreds of movies, obscure comedies, blockbusters, Absurd schlock. I was looking for a template that would explain to me how to feel. Except it didn't work this time. I needed more. From the day you died, I had been sleeping a lot. I was still tired when I woke up, but at least it passed the time. Then everything changed. Sleeplessness kicked in. I spent my nights trying to understand, what am I still doing here?
Do you remember this cup? Every morning you would drink your hot cocoa from it. I had to take it out of the dishwasher so many times. You wanted nothing else. It was in a box for a while. I thought about it sometimes when I thought about you. It was there. One day I pulled it out of one of the boxes. I wanted a hot cocoa and it slipped out of my hands. My heart skipped a beat in that moment. I held my breath for one second. And then... Nothing. I just picked up the pieces one by one and threw them in the garbage. I wondered whether I was a monster for not feeling devastated. But now I know that I'm not. I stayed strong. And it turns out that being able to do that changed everything. That day I realized that I was strong and that I could do it alone. Then I understood. I turned on my computer and I started typing. Not a soap opera episode like I was writing before you died. It was something personal and I think it was important. A movie script, a beautiful kind of sad story. It could be a nice feature if I ever finish it one day. I was surprised to feel the desire to write, but now I understand how priceless it was. It allowed me to switch roles. I was no longer the grieving mother or the young divorcee or the daughter of. I was writing. I was becoming an author. I was inventing a reality that was just as valid as another. You know, I was telling the truth earlier when I said that there were only two ways out in life. But whether you escape or disappear, in the end you're doing the same thing. Now I understand that I had to find another way. And complete solitude allowed me to face the void and to rewrite myself. It was the only way for me to change completely from the ground up. you want everything to be just like before. Alex and I can reinvent ourselves. I know that we can, but that's going to require a lot more work. I would love for things to work out that way, Alex, just like in the movies. But the scene when they get back together, the happy end, we all know that's not happening. Too bad. You're at least as sexy as Ryan Gosling. Yeah. And I definitely have better abs. I noticed that the other day. Is that new? See? You're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry things ended the way they did between us. I left because I was losing my bearings. And I felt like you were also going off track. You know, trying to convince us that we would be okay. I was trying to help you. That's the problem. Y you couldn't have. I was too... too sad. I, I was unable to listen. I couldn't keep leaning so much on you. I couldn't stand it. I had reached a breaking point. If I didn't make a big change, I would have... But I was not allowed to die. I had no right, so I tried living. All the people who matter to me have something in common. They all taught me that I could live without someone else. Marie taught me that I could live without a father, that I could exist as a woman in a world created for men. But she never taught me what it was like to be loved. Alex taught me that I could live without Marie. All of a sudden, I was worth more than I thought, and she much less than I thought. 
But what he loved the most about me was that he could be there for me. I don't hold it against him. We are who we are. He loved me, but he didn't help me love myself. And then you were there. And you taught me the most important thing. You taught me that I could live, even without Marie, even without Alex, even without you. Without you. You know, I changed too. I believe you, Alex. So don't you think it may be a good time to try again? We can't try again if we're strangers to each other. Wow. That's a Nobel Wisdom Prize right there. <laughs> That's not even a thing. Exactly. You know... Oh, I don't know if I should tell him this, but... I will always love you. And oftentimes I think to myself that we could start something new. We'd hop in the car and road trip through Ardèche. I would take off my flip-flops and rest my bare feet on the dashboard. And you would yell at me because that's nasty. That is definitely nasty. Oh, oh, nastier than your damn Tupperware up in the fridge? Nastier than your clumps of hair in the bathroom sink? Uh, probably not. <laughs> but then I realized that all of these are memories. Some are good, many are, but some are dreadful. Those memories with you... They're too much to handle, which means I don't have a choice. I have to leave it all behind. You understand? Then, what about last week? Look, Alex, I don't want to hurt him, but... I'm going to hang up now. I blew off down to pick up the phone, thinking this was an emergency. But it is an emergency. I'm sure Diane will understand. Alex, you don't know. <sighs> Fine. The one time I need your help. Oh, poor guy. He's about to feel very bad about this. Oh, well, that was his dumb choice. Alex, I'm at the hospital. Oh, shit. Are you okay? What happened? Or was it Diane? Don't worry, I'm fine. And, and so is your dear Diane. It's my mother. She had... Uh... Oh. I should be happy that he's relieved, but man, that's harsh. But let's be honest. Alex has never been too keen on her anyway. Do you want to know how he described her? The mug of a James Bond villain, the personality of a public restroom, and the pictorial style of a drunken tardigrade. I'm sure he thought that she was being unfair to me, and that annoyed him. So, he avoided her as much as possible. <laughs> the worst part is that she loved him, but he could see right through her. She understood very quickly that he would not treat her with kid gloves. And she appreciated that, because she loved fighting. Alex didn't like that I wasn't as critical of Marie as he was. He probably thought that I was a bit um, masochistic. I wasn't. It's just that I'm her daughter, and she's my only mother. Alex, this is my mother we're talking about. I mean, sure, this is Marie, but still. What happened to a lady of the pen brush? I know it wasn't a heart. She doesn't have one. That doesn't sound like Alex. Not at all. What's happening to him? Is he drunk? It's a bit early to start drinking. Should I be worried? Or perhaps I shouldn't say anything. It's not funny, Alex. It's just... It's not funny. It's actually pretty insensitive. Which is not like you. Are you okay? Come on. It's just a joke. Except nothing is ever just a joke. Anyway, what do you care if I'm okay? Hmm? I mean, I care about you, and <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> Are you doing a stand-up routine now? Hopefully, that works out better than movies did. Right. I don't know what's going on, but I have no time for this, okay? So, I'm just gonna hang up now. Yeah, you hang up. You can call me any time, day or night, even show up at my house unannounced. I'm here. No worries. But if it's the reverse, I can go right on to hell. 
That's unfair, Alex. I don't... Unfair? Really? Have I ever not been there for you? What is that supposed to mean? Are we keeping score? That's news to me. I never asked you to be there. I don't owe you a thing, okay? Just call Pauline if you're looking for comfort. That's too easy, you know. Giving up on me now that you no longer need me. Mm, Alex, it's been almost two years What since if I had done that to you when Astrid died? Oh, go fuck yourself, Alex! <sighs> what a dumbass! How dare he bring you up in the middle of all this? He never forgave me for what happened, but he's too cowardly to tell it to my face. He's right, though. I don't know how I would have managed if he weren't there when you... And on top of that, I hold him responsible. I guess I'm an ungrateful bitch, huh? Oh, what? Of all the stories I know, this is probably the least funny one. <laughs> Although it's not like any of this has been particularly fun so far. But sometimes, well, thinking back about darker things does help shine a light on them. And actually, I think this one ends well. All right? I'll tell you this story. Alex was a great dad who took good care of his child. He showered her, cooked her food, invented games for her. Any time the little girl was home, his deep laughter would shake the house's walls. And then, one day, Alex no longer feels like laughing. Astrid was both a little girl and a very big girl. When she turned four, she decided she would brush her own teeth. She was so eager to grow up. And then one day, Astrid disappears. Junon was a mom who had made a huge mistake. She had bruises everywhere. A broken arm? Her skull was split. It wasn't a pretty sight. But Alex didn't mind, and still took care of her. Junon was quite sure that she didn't deserve it. And then one day, she gets better. Marie was a grandmother who was often angry. As a result, she and Junon did not talk much. It was too exhausting. And then one day, Marie calls. Time passes, and Junon's body fixes itself. The bones heal, the bruises fade. Doctors call it a miracle. Junon doesn't agree. But these doctors are no good anyway. They didn't even notice that Junon's heart is strewn all around. Time passes, but a big little girl doesn't just disappear. She leaves toys and drawings lying around, and all kinds of fist-sized marks, like tiny little clenched fists punching holes into Junon's heart. Time passes, and the phone rings. Again, and again, and again. Junon doesn't know what Marie wants, but she can guess. 
Marie was there when Junon made her big mistake. And if Junon picks up, they'll have to talk about it. Junon can't forgive herself. So the phone rings, and nobody answers. Time passes, and Alex is still standing. He misses his daughter. He misses laughing, too. But he doesn't show it. He's taking care of everything. He cleans up, he cooks, he washes. He wants people to know that he won't crumble down. Marie keeps on calling. When the accident happened, Marie knocked her head. She looks like she's better now, but Junon is still thinking that she almost killed her. Her too, she might add, so she's not picking up. One day, Alex puts away every hint of Astrid into a big box. The apartment seems a bit empty all of a sudden. But it is what it is. And Alex isn't crying. Alex wants to rescue Junon from her sadness, wash her hair, cut her nails, spoon feed her. He wants to be the guy you can rely on to walk back home when you're tired. But today, Junon is not walking back. Junon doesn't want to be saved. Not by Alex. Not by anyone. She puts her finger through the candle flame to feel the bite. She wants to hurt. Just like that time. Broken bones and ripped up flesh. She's angry that her heart is still beating. And then one day... Are you sure you want to know the rest of the story, my little fawn? I hadn't prepared anything. I was just going to wash up. I had closed the door, taken off my clothes, turned on the shower, and I started crying. I couldn't stop. I couldn't go on. I had medicine for my broken heart. And I decided to swallow it all. Your toothbrush was on the edge of the bathroom sink, which made me think of my very big little girl. Her smile full of toothpaste. I thought that maybe I too could give it a try, but I had forgotten how to. I put those little pills in my mouth, and they tasted funny on my tongue. I just needed to swallow them. And right at that moment, the phone started ringing. Marie didn't ask me why I didn't answer the phone for a whole year. She started talking as if nothing happened. I was crying too much, I couldn't answer. So she told me she could wait. And she waited until the last tear was shed, and then... She told me something she had never told me. Perhaps one day I can tell you exactly what it was. But, long story short, it meant she loved us very much, you and I. In that moment, I felt like an enormous weight was lifted off of my shoulders, as if she had given me the most beautiful gift. And then she changed the subject, as she does. She had a proposal for me. Her career was taking off, and she needed someone to do the clerical work. She knew I would do it well. She told me, it's a boring job. I'm not doing you any favors, but you can do me one. I accepted. Alex 
never learned what really happened that day. He panicked because he could no longer hear me, so he broke the door. But he was too late. It was all over already. That's it, my little fawn. That's the end of my story. If it weren't for Marie, I wouldn't be here to tell you. Because she gave me more than words that day. She helped me understand that it was time I made my own decisions. That's the thing I figured out that night. And it changed me for the better. I would no longer rely on others to save me. Not on Marie, not Alex, not anyone else. I couldn't live like that. Not anymore. Have I ever not been there for you? He didn't actually understand. He didn't get the dynamic we had and what it did to us. And me neither, actually. Up until today, I lived some sort of a misunderstanding. But it's over. It's true. You were there. Not just when we lost Astrid, you've always been there. I knew that whatever happened, you'd be there. It's not easy to explain why you fall in love with someone. There was no love at first sight between your father and I. We even lost touch after high school. And still... One night, we went out on a date, and I immediately knew that it would last. There was something in his eyes. When he looked at me, I felt like he saw something invisible. Something wonderful, something valuable. I couldn't believe, in fact, he was looking at me. I was really anxious at the time about everything. But when I woke up at his place the next day, for a brief moment, the oppressive feeling had disappeared. It happened again when I saw him the next day and the day after. And then after that, every time we met, in spite of the distance, I felt like I was taking drugs. And it was really good. And I loved it. I didn't have that growing up with Marie. I felt like you believed in me. You're the only one who made me feel this way. You and Astrid. Yes, you too, my little dear. I believe in you. I know. Being with you was a gift, but it had to stop. After Astrid died. You see, my little fawn, even when you're gone, you're never very far. Even before, I was just letting you lead me around. When Astrid died, I did what I always do. I leaned on you. You would have the answer. You would know what to do, but... <laughs> But now, though, I understand. This whole time, your poor dad was fishing out corpses. Not literally. Don't worry, I'm not going crazy. It's just... It reminds me of this story I read while doing research for a screenplay. The story of a guy named Wei Peng, a farmer in the Yellow River Valley who found himself... a unique occupation. His cabin is 20 kilometers downstream from Lanzhou an industrial city that attracts poor folks looking for work. And their life is so terrible that a bunch of them are committing suicide. Lanzhou is mostly known for its thermal plants, its factories, and the highest level of atmospheric pollution in all of China. That said, there are cities like Lanzhou all around the world. Every morning, Wei Peng grabs his pitchfork, hops into his small boat, and he searches the river. He's looking for bulky and soft lumps. Most of the time, they're goat carcasses. But every now and then, he finds humans. When Wei Peng manages to identify the body, he sells it. Otherwise, he buries it. Between 500 and 5,000 yuan, depending on the client. I understood why people paid him. It's a horrible feeling not knowing what happened to a loved one. They were purchasing more than a mortal coil. They were purchasing 
peace of mind. But I didn't get why Wei Peng did it. How can you live with this job? Then I reached the end of the article. His own child died in that river. A kid your age, trying to retrieve a ball in the water. Wei Peng didn't know how to swim. He couldn't do anything. And now I understand Wei Peng. Just as I understand Alex. Some people find it easier to alleviate other people's grief than to deal with their own pain head on. Maybe that worked for you, being in that position. As long as you were taking care of me, you wouldn't have to think about yourself or about Astrid. Maybe I... I never... I never thought about it that way. <laughs> me neither, you know, I, I only understand this now. Okay, then. Why? If I thought I was helping you, but actually hurting, why did you come back to see me? I really shouldn't have. I don't know what came over me. I was... happy to see you again. Of course, I liked it too. But it also felt like a farewell. That's besides the point. I, I don't know why I did what I did. I don't even know why I went to your house. Because you wanted to see me. It's true. I'm telling you, I have no idea why I went. Maybe it was out of habit? I think that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Alex. His way of figuring stuff out has always fascinated me. I couldn't figure out a character story arc. He figured it out. I couldn't get in touch with producers. He figured it out. I couldn't live without you. He figured it out. I believe that's why I went to see him last week. So he could figure it out for me. Except I didn't even know what my problem was on that day. If only it were that simple. Anyway, it was really stupid, and I probably hurt you. Come on, Jin, stop that. Last week you were happy. For the first time since I can remember. Oh, what would you know? We haven't seen each other in months. That is true. And it wasn't my call. You're the one who left. And I respected your choice. I learned how to live without you. And you showed up on my doorstep out of fucking nowhere? What am I supposed to think? Yeah. He's totally right about that. I'm sorry, Alex. I truly am. I, I know you're angry and... I'm not angry. But I was in a bad place. I didn't know what to do. I needed to see someone. Why not your sister, then? Or call a girlfriend? Even your mother, for that matter. I... You came to see me. Because I know what you are feeling. I understand your pain. Don't you think? No, I don't think so. You don't understand anything. <sighs> well, if you really understand, then why do I... Why the hell do I feel so alone? No one can understand what I feel, ever. No one can tell me how to live with this, how to do this. It's a gaping hole in the fabric of life, and living with that big a hole in you is, it's impossible. Do you remember your dollhouse? Marie gave it to you. She had built it herself in secret. 
it was really detailed. There were even miniature figurines of Alex and I for you to play with. Of course you remember. <laughs> you took to it immediately. You were making up all kinds of stories about daily life where you were the hero. It's true. I did it. I stole your house from Alex and threw it away. I don't know why. Could you forgive me? If I had a really good reason? This is Pauline, your father's new girlfriend. Actually, we've known her since high school, but I, I haven't seen her in a while. She's a great girl, you know. I'm sure your dad will be happy with her. To be honest, I always wondered why he picked me over her back then. Your dad is still making video games, but he quit the big company he used to work for. Now he's making a game on his own. I don't know much about it. I think it's about you. In a way, every game he ever worked on talked about you. The games you were playing together actually gave him tons of ideas for his work. I thought Alex had gotten rid of that house when he cleaned out your room. After you passed, I never wondered where it was. I just forgot about it. Some people say that the dead haunt houses. I was afraid that you would haunt that one. Afraid to hear your voice if I stared at it for too long. Alex moved into this place with his new girlfriend about a year ago. He looked happy. Suburban homes aren't my thing, but I was relieved that he had finally left the apartment where the three of us had lived. I learned that Alex and Pauline were moving in together. I thought he had turned the page. Do you want to know what I felt? It's complicated. I think I was impressed. Uh, once more, your father had demonstrated that he was stronger than me. And I'd like to say that I was happy for him. But in truth, I envied him. I pictured Alex alone in his office, using his job as an excuse to play with your house. I found that beautiful. That didn't fit at all with the idea I had of him, always moving forward, never moping around. And then I realized that maybe... Maybe he wasn't telling me everything about his feelings. Your father had everything. A new girlfriend, a nice house, his life on track. Meanwhile, I was over here, toiling, slowly crawling out of the hole. And I needed to see him so he could comfort me. Just like... Like before, I thought he owed me that. He started doing it at work, just so that he could meet his deadlines. Sometimes we did it together, at parties, for fun. Oh, all right, I know it's bad, but when we knew that you were coming, we stopped. And that's why I was surprised to see some at his place last week. He tried to hide it, but I laughed in his face. I'm not his mom. Still, though, I, well, I thought to myself it was a bad sign. Alex looked gaunt. N not just because of the blow, it was like, I keep been crying. I, I tried to talk to him, ask him how he was doing. He just dodged the question. Uh, so I insisted, but he said he wanted to show me something and he started a video game, something called Night Call, a murder mystery noir where you play a taxi driver. It was really good, but it's hard to have a conversation with a controller in your hands.
Perhaps I threw away that house because I was jealous of Alex's new life. In fact, I might have wanted to show your father what he was losing by losing us. Perhaps I threw away that house because I was mad at Alex. His whole stuck in nostalgia thing, I found it incredibly offensive. Perhaps I threw away the house to shake up Alex, to get a reaction from him, so he could be mad at me, so he could snap out of his lurch. We had a great night in the end. We drank beers, we played, we laughed. And after a while, he asked me what I was doing there, really. I thought about telling him the truth, but instead I... I kissed him. I don't know what came upon me. He kissed me. And more. It was very nice. Much more intense than it used to be before. And it made me want to cry because... that was way too late. Perhaps I threw away that house because that was my gift to him. Perhaps I thought he needed this old relic out of his life. Like he needed me out of his life. I'm sure all of that contributed to my reaction to a certain extent. I was jealous, a bit petty, conflicted. And on top of that, I was a dollhouse thief. But there was something else, something that really hurt me and that I'm only understanding now I was ashamed I came to demand support from Alex I thought it was unfair that he was already happy again. But when I came across that dollhouse, I realized that he missed you as much as I did, which is actually why I threw it away. That's the reason the dollhouse was proof that for years I had been blinded. I was ashamed to only realize now that he too was hurting. Don't you think? How... How is this possible? How did I not realize that he was hurting, too? And how come he never told me about it? Well, how about you, Alex? Should we talk about that? What? What do you mean? How many times have we talked about Astrid together? About her death? Dozens of times? Hundreds, maybe? That's because we needed to. I needed that. That was the only thing I could talk about, and Alex was always there to listen to me. To check how I'm doing, to inquire about my feelings, to assess my needs, to ask if there was anything else he could do. And I never asked him any questions. Not a single one. Are you sure about that? What do you mean, am I sure? You were devastated. And you? How did you feel? Come on, again with this shit. Pauline is always trying to make me talk to. I don't have anything to say. What am I supposed to say? There's no way you never felt the need to talk about those feelings. That whole time when you finally got me to calm down and fall asleep? How did you feel? What did you think? I... I, I don't know. I can't remember. Why are you dragging this up now? Because... I never thought to ask you back then. Well, that's alright. I... I'm okay. 
I was okay. It's not your fault. She's still doing it. He's still trying to protect me all the time. It... He needs to understand that things have changed. No, maybe not. Anyway, I probably wouldn't have listened to what you had to say. I was unable to. But now I'm thinking to myself that well, it wasn't fair. You know, I just realized something and I'm so ashamed about it. You're hurt too. And, and that didn't even occur to me until now. I was thinking about you. Not about Astrid? When I was alone at night, I was thinking about what I needed to do to help you get better. That's all I thought about. You needed me. That kept me going. And now that you're no longer here... I lived in fear of everything for a long time. Fear of making the wrong choice, fear of making mistakes, fear of not being good enough, not smart enough. And Alex was an antidote against all these fears. He was acting like he didn't have wounds of his own. But I knew that he did. One day, for instance, he told me about his parents. They love each other the same as ever. They're very good together. For them, having a child just came as a natural step to their relationship. They were nice, patient, kind. They ticked all the boxes. But in the end, parenting, that wasn't their thing. I think that in spite of their best efforts, they don't give a flying fuck about me. Maybe that's the reason why he, on the other hand, cared so much about us. Maybe your hugs and my kisses were the things that helped him cope. You can take care of yourself. All this energy you expended for me was admirable, but... It was also holding you captive. You're free now. Free from what? Free to face your own emotions and deal with them, to heal your own pain. I... You know, if I ever think too much about her, about how much I miss her, I have to stop. It makes me dizzy, it scares me. I'm pathetic. Of course you're not. I understand. That's tweaked to me that was... just like before. Alex? Are you still there? <laughs> Marie had this weird rule back home. You only get to cry once. It didn't matter the reason, from bike falls to headaches to world hunger. She had this theory that there are two reasons one might cry. Either from surprise, when life sucker punches you, or from cowardice, when you give up on fighting back. You only get to cry once from surprise she used to say, and there is no time for cowardice. Well, I think she forgot that there was a third possibility. Sometimes you cry because you've mustered up the courage to look at life how it is. Oh, if you're crying, I'm going to cry too. You'll never beat me at this game. I have a lot of practice. <laughs> Oh, crap, Gino, I'm so sorry. You don't owe me anything. I guess I should leave you alone. Yeah, well, I haven't exactly made it easy for you. But I'm not doing well, okay? Really, I'm not. Wow. You don't get these heartfelt moments from him, ever. Since last week? Let me show you something. He wants to video chat. Oh, wow. This is... Uh... Did I ever tell you the story of the lookout? It's a very special place for us. We were driving, 
Alex, you and I, it was a really hot day. Over 40 degrees. Okay, maybe not, but it was stifling in a car without AC. I remember that the sun was setting. I was eager to get home. I was just exhausted. So when you told me your tummy was hurting, I didn't really believe you. I remember clearly thinking, oh, she's okay. And then hearing the sound, like snow falling from the top of a roof on the first warm day. Except it wasn't snow. It was the worst pile of vomit I had ever smelled. When he saw your face in the rear view, Alex knew he had to stop immediately. You looked truly positively puzzled. You were staring at the puddle beneath your feet, then looking around to see where it came from. And I was twisting and contorting from the front seat, but unable to help. I didn't even wait for the car to stop. I jumped out, went for your door, and squeezed you against me. I didn't care if I got dirty. I just wanted you to feel good. I thought it was my fault. I should have listened to you. Your forehead was hot. It, it could be serious. I carried you out to the banister on the end of the clearing and laid you on the grass. Your face was pale and your eyes were bulging and you started screaming. Oh, dear. You were vomiting, looking up, staring in the distance, screaming. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. And I, I didn't understand. I kept asking you, what's wrong, baby? Patting your back, pulling your hair away from your face to help. And there was a pit growing in my stomach and my eyes were welling up. I was terrified. And your dad was terrified. You were smiling. You pointed in front of you. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So we turned around. And on the other side of the banister, there was a cliff going straight down. And down below, there was a prairie stretching between two leafy bushes and in the middle of the prairie there was a deer i could have written this whole scene he was standing tall beneath the sunset as if holding it with his antlers and he was looking at us completely stunned he was magnificent alex took a picture with his cell phone and you kept repeating a deer a deer clapping your hands when he finally jumped out into the bushes. Wow, we were in a daze, you know. We couldn't believe the beauty of what we'd just seen. And then you vomited one last time on your dad's shoes. And that day, you became the world's greatest deer fan, my little deer. What are you doing over there? Do you recognize the place? Of course I do. I'll never forget the lookout. Every time I take this road, I have to stop. The other drivers don't get it, of course. They ask me if I need assistance, if I broke down or something. I'm just trying to enjoy the view. It's so beautiful. Today I came here just for that. Why the sudden rush of nostalgia? Did you see the deer again? No. I never saw the deer again. I never see the deer again. And that really, really sucks. Uh, Alex? You're scaring me a bit. You don't look well. I'm not well. You were right, you know. This whole time I thought I was helping you. I thought you needed me so you wouldn't crumble. But that was a goddamn lie. I was the one who needed you. Even before Astrid died, I needed you. Helped Juno you know, with her tyrannical mother. Helped Juno you know, with her screenwriting career. Shows you know how to be happy. <laughs> A good one. It was easier for me to think you had issues. But I was the goddamn issue. It can't be easy for him to realize this. But he has to. At least I hope so. You're not an issue, Alex. And still, you got out as soon as you had the chance. I know you can be forgetful when it suits you, but that's pushing it. I remember getting in the car with you. I remember waking up in the hospital with Alex by my side. But what happened in between, it's a black hole for me. 
Apparently, that's pretty common. During extreme events, your brain does not generate memories. It's too busy surviving. I survived. Which I guess means that my brain worked really well. But since then, it's been mulling over this one question. Was it all my fault? I was half expecting your dad to hold it against me one day, anyway. But it doesn't hurt any less. <sighs> that was really shitty. I... I'm sorry. I'm just tired and sad. Do you want to know why I don't think about Astrid? The real reason? When I think about her, I say things to myself that hurt too much. That I will never see her again. That I will never hear her voice again. That I will never carry her to bed in my arms. How am I supposed to live with that? If only I had the answer to that question. It takes time. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It takes time. Except the more time passes, the worse it gets. And I'm getting tired of waiting. What are you saying? Alex, what are you saying? This place is as beautiful as ever, you know? Really beautiful. Bye, Jean. Good luck. Alex, don't... Alex? Alex! Shit, I gotta get over there. Shit, Alex. I have a really bad feeling about this. Alex is strong, but... He didn't look well. I've never seen him like this. I could be imagining this, but if anything happens to him, I will never forgive myself. Oh, wow. You did what? Oh, come on. I panicked. I just felt like something shady was about to happen. If you think I had any time to think. And also, I was drunk as a skunk, so... You're insane? Completely insane? You really think so? Uh, yeah. This is $3,000 whiskey. You could at least have saved me a glass. <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> I never felt the need to lie to your father. I always told him everything, because I felt like he understood me. I can't just ignore other people's judgment. I'm not strong enough. But with Alex, I never felt judged. All right. You settled? Uh, more or less. And what are you up to? Are you writing again? Shoot, Jan, how did you know? Lady, this isn't rocket science. You're just like Mom. It's in your blood. Why do you think Alex has been pushing you all these years? You're the only one who's unaware that you're an artist. For a long time, I thought Alex was pushing me to write out of mercy because he thought that it would somehow fill a void in my life. It had never occurred to me that maybe I was actually talented and that he had figured it out.
remember the first time we made love? How could I forget? Your arm got stuck as you took your shirt off, and you just stood there with your boobs out. That picture is forever etched in my memory. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever going to come to my help? Certainly not. I had waited so long for that moment. I was relishing it. I will always love your father, you know. Forever. Being able to strip naked, completely naked, and feeling good anyway, that's rare. I hope that I will experience this feeling again one day with someone else. But I'm happy to have known that once in my life already. With him. Time to say goodbye to your dad, I guess. I mean, farewell to us. I can no longer be with him because your absence would take up too much space. And also because I realize now that our relationship had something kind of unhealthy. But that doesn't take away from who he is or from what he gave me. Our story together is ending, but each of us still exists. And we're even stronger than before because we've grown up ready for a better rest of our lives. Shaken, transformed, rattled, but unbroken. How am I supposed to live with that? Today, it's your dad who feels like his heart is in a million pieces. And this time, I'm the one who can help him understand that it's not all broken. I don't know. What happened to us was as unfair as it gets. I understand why it looks impossible to overcome. But I also know that you will find a way. That's who you are, Alex. You always find solutions. I'm actually trying to learn that from him. Do you remember my stalker? What are you talking about? The guy on Facebook who used to send me dick pics throughout the day? You told me you would take care of it, and I was scared it would end up badly. It did end badly. For him. <laughs> I still have no idea how you found his mom and his dad's home address. I would have loved to see their faces when they unrolled their kid's dick poster size. <laughs> it wasn't cheap, but it was worth it. <sighs> You'll be all right, Alex. Sometimes you need to let go of things you thought would be forever. But you're still here. Unbreakable. And to be honest, Pauline is totally Eva Mendez. Come on, you're stupid. You know I'm not actually Ryan Gosling, right? Uh, just let me live my fantasies, please. Thank you, Juno. Do you think it was damaging, us being together? Hmm, to each other or to ourselves? We did what we could. I would have loved to know another way. Yeah, but it makes sense that we can only now understand these things. I think that's called growing up. I'm sorry for what I said about Marie. I hope she gets better. <laughs> it's okay, Alex. I'm not going to blame you for always being on my side. Did you go see her? No, not yet. You should, because you never know. You're right. Of course he's right. Then why is it so hard? Genon, I need to tell you something. I know that you don't remember the accident, and I know you can't help it. And I know it's not fair, but I resent you for that, and it scares me. I'd like to believe that knowing what happened that day wouldn't change a thing, but I know that's not true, because there are only two options. Either my daughter is dead, or I killed my daughter. Scares. Yeah. Sometimes I feel really angry. I think that not knowing is driving me crazy. 
So if one day you do remember something, anything really, please tell me. I don't know if I will, but... I'll try, Alex. I promise. You don't owe me a thing, June. You already gave me the best years of my life. Damn! Pulitzer Prize for wisdom! No, no. I'm competing in the batshit conclusion Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go, Jean. Don't do anything stupid, okay? What? <laughs> no way. I would never. Did I sound that depressed to you? A little bit, yeah. But I could be projecting. I just need to... I'm going to call Pauline, actually. Say hi to Diane for me. And... Good luck with your mom. It's going to be okay. I think so, too. I'll talk to you soon, Alex. <sighs> what a conversation. But I think it really helped us. Really? Why couldn't we talk like this before? That depends on what before we're talking about here. Before you were born? Before you died? Or before we split up? Before you died, we talked about you constantly. All the time. We stopped navel-gazing. And I think that Alex and I were a great team of parents, weren't we? I miss you a lot, you know? Hey, what are you doing here? Did you follow me? It's forbidden to be here. Hey, wait! Where are these kids' parents? Come back! That could be dangerous! Oof! I haven't run this much since high school. Hey! Can you hear me? Hello? This kid, I swear. Anyone here? There she is. What is she up to? Hey, get down from there! It's dangerous! Don't worry, Mom. It's fine. No. No, no, no. I've got to get out of here. Seriously, though, what is happening? Am I going crazy? Will you be sticking around this time, or are you gonna run away again? What the hell is happening? Hey, what's up with the curse words? Are they allowed now? Did you just hear what I was thinking? Are you surprised? You've been talking to me in your head for years. Was I supposed to leave you hanging forever? Is it really you? It couldn't possibly be the real me, seeing how I'm, you know, dead. Like Dad used to say, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Just make sure you think before you ask. Uh, so what are you? A ghost? Oh, maybe I'm finally going crazy. I'm not a ghost. At least, I don't think so. Let's just say that I'm... Here. Isn't that good enough? It's more than good enough, my little fawn. 
This is the best thing that's happened to me in a long time. Probably the most worrying thing also. Mom! Am I really scaring you right now? Hey, don't do that! Did nobody teach you it's rude to read people's minds? How about you stop thinking and talk to me instead? Oh, you've grown up so much. A proper mini Astrid Hofferson. Astrid Hofferson? Who's that? It's a long story. Ah, my favorite kind. Uh, okay, but I know you, so you can't interrupt me, okay? Okay. But tell me when we're up there. Oh, wow. The view is really nice. When I was pregnant, I spent a lot of time at home. And I used that time to watch a lot of movies. All thanks to me. <laughs> exactly. You weren't even born yet, but I already loved you so much. Except one day, the internet went down. So, I was forced to comb through your father's nerdy DVDs. And the best I could find was... This cartoon. <laughs> now hold on a second. What's wrong with cartoons? <laughs> uh, the opinions of a Peppa Pig fan mean nothing to me. Although, you are right. It was really good. What was it? What was it about? It was called How to Train Your Dragon. It was about dragons. I love dragons. Of course you do. I don't. Dragons are tacky. But there was this great character in the movie. Astrid Hofferson. Ah, ah, ah. No interrupting. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, Astrid Hofferson. She was a young and courageous Viking. Her belt was made of skulls. So cool. So she's the hero? Of course not. The hero is a bumbling idiot who we're supposed to sympathize with just because he has a shitty father. Let's not forget the movie was written by a bunch of Hollywood guys. But still, Astrid is a great character. Especially because she has a really useful asset. She's a warrior. People try to tie her up with all these rules, and that doesn't stop her. Not only that, she becomes the best in spite of the rules. And when they change the rules, ha, she's still the best. Because she believes in herself enough that she can question herself. Wow. And she's also really supportive of Harold, the idiot hero. When he is doubting himself, she's there for him. Not to snuggle, though. <laughs> Quite the reverse. She shakes him up. She, she chews him out. All of this leading up to the realization that he can make it on his own. I thought that was beautiful. I told your dad that night and he laughed. <laughs> he said he'd always love that character too. And that's why my name is Astrid? It is. We were hoping you would become a warrior, a rebel, sensitive and smart. Someone like Astrid Hofferson. Someone like you. Excuse me? Don't be modest. You've done pretty well so far. Wait, what do you mean by so far? Well, with Auntie Jan and Dad. You struggled for a bit, but eventually you managed to find the right words. That was impressive. Oh, not really. I kind of suck. Hey! That's my mother you're talking about. And it's not true. I mean, look at me. I turned out okay. Oh, my little fawn. Before you were born. I was so terrified. Of what? The delivery? No. Which is weird, actually, because objectively speaking, the thought of pushing a head as big as a coconut through my vagina... Uh... Mom, you're so gross. I mean, it's not like you're gonna traumatize me, but I'm meant to be like nine, remember? So what was it that was so scary then? 
I was going to share my life with someone for the first time. But you were already sharing it with Dad. <laughs> it's not the same, little dear. We love each other very much, me and your dad, but we knew that it could always evaporate. I still care about him a lot, but things will never be the same between us. With you, I knew it was for life. And that was scary? I was a little afraid of losing myself, but I also loved the idea. When you were born, I knew only one thing. I'd never be alone again. That's how it was supposed to be. <laughs> But I screwed it up. I was a shitty parent. Just like I was a shitty daughter and a shitty wife. And I lost you. Mom, stop. You didn't lose me. You really think that I... What? Disappeared? I abandoned you. And I think about it all the time, whenever I close my eyes. What happens when you close your eyes? I feel the shards of glass on my skin, on my clothes, beneath my feet. I see the crown of your hair, sparkling like a tiny sunshine on the tarmac. And then I see your open eyes. How can I ever be happy with that tattooed on my eyelids? Mom, maybe you should stop thinking about it. Thinking about it like that, I mean. I don't want to. I, I mustn't. If I stopped thinking about it, that would be like killing you all over again. Astrid? Don't leave me, Astrid. I don't want you to leave. Really, do I have to? Do I need to recall this particular exhibit of Marie's? It's a nice memory for her, obviously, but for me it's pretty bitter, even though I can't explain why exactly. A lot of memories came back to me that night. I would stand in the middle of the gallery with my eyes closed and they'd crop up as if they were connected in some way. Come to think of it, there may be something to unearth in my own personal exhibit. We'll see. Let me show you around. You know this tableau, my little fawn? It's been gathering dust in the back of my personal collection. I haven't displayed it in ages. And here the artist is depicting her first day at the beach with her daughter. Do you remember? The weather was so nice that day. We had eaten ice cream under the big umbrella. Then you pulled out your little tongue, your head got close to my arm, and I felt something cold and wet above my elbow. You taste salty, you said.
You started worshipping the sand as soon as we got there. You were delighted. We were already imagining you as a teenager with like 7,933 vials of sand everywhere and a subscription to Sand Fans, the Arenophile Review. <laughs> hey, if it was between that or weed, we weren't sure which would be worse. You came up to me with a huge seashell. I never understood where you found it. You handed it to me with great pomp and told me I had to write a movie about it. I complained. I don't know his life. I have no idea what he's thinking about. If he's sad or... And then you asked me, so about what is it that you write movies then? And I was speechless for a moment, but... Suddenly I felt it welling up in my heart and my stomach. Happiness. And then that's it. That's what I wanted to write about. I had totally forgotten this, but at one point in my life, I wanted to write about happiness. Since the dawn of time, people have needed rituals to mark the big life events. Here, the artist is depicting her final farewell to her daughter. At least that's what she thought at the time. Neither Alex nor I could picture you in a tiny coffin. We really preferred that you remained with us. Like fine sand in a pretty vase. But in the end, even that was too heavy. I kept thinking about it. One day, on a whim, I made the call. I didn't tell your father. I didn't feel like explaining. I just called Diane, and I told her to meet me over there, by the sea. And she didn't ask any questions, nothing. She just said, I'll be there. I was crying when we arrived at the cliff, overlooking the beach. Diane gently took out the urn from my hand, opened it towards the sea, and she said, Donny was a good bowler, and a good man. He was a man who loved the outdoors, and bowling. <laughs> I burst out laughing, and snot spurted out of my nose all over my fucking chin. And Dan was laughing too, and a thousand particles of you flew out around us, all up in my hair. I thought it would be freeing to see you leave like this, disappear. That was the goal of this ceremony, but now I know that it didn't work. It didn't make me feel free, rather it made me feel the emptiness. Here the artist is depicting herself on the bus, back from the shore. Outside, the setting sun represents uh, something or other. Is it the end of something or the beginning? I was holding your urn against me the whole way back. It was empty, but it felt heavier than ever before. I looked outside the window and this poem came to my mind. It's Lamartine. I had to learn it by heart in high school. Setting or just rising in a sky clear or gray, what good is the sun? I disregard the day. Were I to track the whole long course of his travel, my eyes would just witness all the void and gravel. I desire nothing that he could ever disperse. I don't demand a thing from the great universe. I was all by my lonesome on the bus back, with just a few specks of you. That's what I felt when I came back from the cliff. The poem, the empty bus, the urn on my knees. A void. Back then, I, I thought it was a good thing. I said to myself, maybe I can start writing now that this is done. And then, nothing. I remember almost every word of the pretentious card next to Marie's painting. The Otto Portrait series is undoubtedly Marie de Mange's most ambitious work to date. She arranges herself in a discomfitting position 
ripe with malaise and also a certain eroticism. Self-portrait number eight is the final entry in the series and one of the most powerful paintings of the 21st century. I never could bring it up with Marie, but I'm sure that these paintings were actually inspired by the accident. The ground she's lying on, I can almost guarantee you it's pavement and her discombobulated body as if her bones were broken. No one knows that except me. I believe she painted you instead of her. Why on earth would she make such a twisted thing, do you think? Apparently the critics and the public loved it. That was the series from which everything started for Marie. I must say that there was something vibrant in these paintings. A sweet and vulnerable mystery in her eyes. It made me sick. I couldn't believe how many paintings Marie had done since you died. Meanwhile, I couldn't write for my life. It made no sense anymore. When I left Alex, I did get started on something, as if separating from him had inspired me. But after a few months, nothing I had written was worth reading. Those paintings made me so angry. I kept thinking this. Marie is feeding off of my bereavement. Through her art, she managed to turn what happened into something else. Something beautiful. I, on the other hand, had nowhere left to go in that moment. I couldn't do it anymore. My bag of happiness was ripped to shreds. Thank you for visiting this exhibit with me, my little fawn. What did you learn? When I see all of this again, I wonder what made me think that making you disappear would take the pain away. Attempting to erase every bit of you meant locking me out of this incredible little room inside my heart. The place that gave me life. The place that inspired me. Now I know that I need to keep that space for you within myself. So that I can write, and I can live. You're still with me. You really think that I... What? Disappeared? No, of course not, my little phone. But when you died, I found myself in an impossible situation. I was thinking about you all the time. I kept telling myself it was my fault you weren't here anymore. It's awful to love someone that much, you know? On the contrary, I think it's beautiful. Sure, it's beautiful and awful. So, I looked for a solution. How? I did what I always do. I watched movies. Like what? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's about a couple who are separating. <sighs> Mom... I know, I know. I just wasn't in the mood for rom-coms at the time. If I had been, I wouldn't have gone for something starring Jim Carrey. Anyway, in the movie, there's a machine that erases people's painful memories. Jim Carrey is heartbroken, so he uses that machine because... that's the only way he can go on living. That's what I tried to do with you get you out of my mind. Except you didn't have a machine. No. I had medication, I had a job, and I even did a farewell ceremony. I thought that if I could get you out of my head, I might be able to feel better. Did it work? <laughs> of course not. Why should it? That wasn't the right way to handle things. Now I know how lucky I am to be able to think about you every day. Even though it's hard sometimes. I think about your laugh, the one you made when your dad would attack you with a toy knight. I think about your little doodles. You came back from kindergarten every day with fistfuls of them. We filled up all the walls with them. So we ended up having to sneak some into the garbage. 
I knew it! But I promise I always looked carefully at them before. I think about the way you would sound complicated words. Escarpment. Onomatope. Cacophony. They were in stories we'd read to you. You love to parrot them back. I think about all of it, little dear. And it's a reminder that you are here with me. I carry that with me into every decision I have to make. And I won't let it go for the world. <sighs> it's a bit silly, isn't it? What is all of this? Me talking to you right now? Also, just look at this sky. You usually only get these kinds of sunsets in Hollywood movies. Marie is on death's door, and I'm out here chatting with my daughter's ghost? I told you I'm not a ghost. And I love chatting with you, just getting to know you better. It's a little late for that, don't you think? It's never too late for a good story. That's what you always said. I say a lot of stupid stuff. And if you'd written down half the ones you taught me at bedtime, you'd be rich. Do you remember the one with the horse stripe that does karate? <laughs> Ninja Palooza? <laughs> yeah, it was so good. And and the duck who kept solving crimes around the farm while drunk. <laughs> Inspector Drunkass. No one is going to publish that. That's too bad. It would be a lot better than Marie's books of Russian folk tales. Ugh, oh, those books were a snooze fest. Right? Then why did you hug her so hard every time she bought you a new set? Because you can be a child and still know how to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you up to with your script? Uh, I haven't looked at it in ages. Is your job for Grandma taking too much time? Getting myself out of bed is taking too much time. Oh, come on! Stop it! The whole depressive thing doesn't suit you. And, to be honest, I'm not too fond of the whole petulant tween thing. I liked it better when you were four years old. What are you going to do? Give me a spanking? No. Oh, I suppose you're too old for that. So happy to see you. So am I. <laughs> and I think you're very pretty. Oh, thank you, little phone. I only sleep about five hours a night. My hair is so dirty that it won't budge even if I untie it, and I'm smoking more than the Amazon rainforest under Bolsonaro. I've noticed. That's very bad, by the way. That stuff kills, Mom. <sighs> ah, typical me. My imaginary nine-year-old daughter swings by to give me an earful. <laughs> I did tell you that you were pretty first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Astrid. Sorry for what? You know. I have no idea. I don't read minds anymore. My mom raised me better than that. <laughs> That's cute, little phone. I'm so sorry about... <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just... Do you remember what happened? No. I mean, I remember that we were going to Mina's birthday party. I was driving. But after that, it's all a blur. See? That's why I was laughing. You totally forgot how it happened. For all you know, we were struck by a meteor through the windshield or something. So I ask again. Why are you sorry? Stop it. I know what you're trying to do. But whatever happened, it was me, Astrid. It was my fault. All right. You're not ready to talk. You need more time to think. Astrid.
Astrid. Come back. Need more time to think. What did she mean by that? What am I even talking about? I'm mulling over my dead daughter's imaginary advice. I'm going off the deep end here. I know. That's what I need to focus on. I think it's coming back. Yes, it is. Just try a little harder, Juno. I need to dig deeper. Oh, what? What does it mean to be a mother? Is it being 100% focused on your child? Is it always knowing what to do? Never having any doubt? Is it sacrificing your ambition? If you do all that, are you automatically a good mom? What if you don't manage it? Does that make you a bad mom? I've asked myself all of these questions a lot. Do you want to try and find an answer together? Good mom? Bad mom? Maybe I should start with telling you the fun moments. That was the year before you were born. Alex had been on my ass to get in touch with the friend of a cousin of one of his friends who was a producer. Anyway, I was supposed to schedule a meeting with him during the next Cannes Festival. I wasn't planning on going to Cannes at all, but I did what I was told. I managed to slip into a party where I eventually met the guy, and it worked out, yeah. We spent the night smoking cigs, sounding off about the worst turkeys from the festival, and a few weeks later, I was writing a spec for a series. kind of came out of nowhere. I was feeling gunky and I was a bit late, so I decided to take a test without putting too much stock into it. And here is the picture I sent to your dad. I remember that the stick wasn't even dry yet. <laughs> Can you imagine the surprise? I'll admit that back then, I didn't know whether I would be pregnant one day. Your dad and I hadn't really planned it this way. We'd been talking for a while about having a kid one day, but that was only a plan. In the meantime, we were being careful, but we obviously hadn't met you yet. Of course, a mere condom wasn't going to stop you. Ah, as soon as I saw the test, my head exploded, my little fawn. I was happy, ah, oh, just happy, nothing else. It was an incredible feeling. I was so fired up by your birth. I felt like I was high on drugs. I was taking care of you, working, seeing friends. I was living. Alex and I even became involved in politics. We were trading weekends to attend climate marches. I was ready to fight to make a change in the world.
Thus, within the span of a year, I delivered two babies. Astrid, in January, just over eight pounds, hungry as a wolf, and a mug to die for. And then, my first professional screenplay in August. 47 pages. A veritable leap forward in my career. All of a sudden, things just fell into place. I was a screenwriter. I was getting paid for writing. Sure, it was a crappy series, but that third paid very well. I was so proud of everything that was happening to me. And at the same time, I lost sleep over it for weeks. Because there were some darker thoughts, too. The ones your light could not dispel. You didn't really get the chance to witness it, but this is a funny time we're living in. Imagine having an incredible daughter and a job you've wanted forever, and then you get glued to a screen, and it bums you out. I would see people on social media, you know, people I would never even have heard of in real life. And they were great parents, great artists, working on great stuff, having great success. Everybody seemed way ahead of me. And it felt like it was my fault for being so behind. How dared I aspire to being happy? A couple of months before you were born, Marie showed up with a cardboard box under her arm. She had found the mobile. When I was preparing for your arrival, I hung it above your crib. After you were born, I would spend hours watching it turn every time you did. It was always moving, finding its balance. Wonderful. Alive. Just like you, and also so fragile. Way too delicate. A mere gust of wind could have shattered it to a million pieces. Just like you. I found it adorable that Marie came to bring us this mobile. And yet, I was scared when I learned I was pregnant. I was scared at the mere idea of telling her. It was beyond me. I, I panicked. So, I decided to hide you for as long as I could. Obviously, she eventually noticed that I was pregnant. And her reaction was unexpected. She was jumping for joy. Why had I been so scared? It seemed so silly. Fifty-eight tons per year. A kid equals fifty-eight tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's the same as fifty-eight plane trips to New York and back, or burning fifty tons of coal. <sighs> Having a baby in this world, as everything was collapsing around us, that was a stupid idea. I know... Breastfeeding while on a cell phone isn't exactly what you picture from a perfect mother. <laughs> well, that only happened once. Or maybe twice. Or a bunch of times, actually. I loved connecting with you, you know? It was a magnetic force. Time disappeared when I looked into your eyes. But sometimes I was overwhelmed by everything else. The earth that keeps on spinning. The anxiety of not doing enough. Projects at a standstill while others are going full speed. And then the fear that it would all stop. That's always a little bit there. But I think I was stronger than that in the end. I just remembered something that happened years ago. I guess I was 16 or 17 years old. I was in my room, staring at this mobile instead of doing my homework. Marie was in the next room, the living room, giving an interview. It was a first. I overheard her talking to the journalist with a soft voice. She was obviously trying to win her over. It was funny at first. She was giving all these juicy details about the crazy nights of a female artist in the 80s. 
And then she said she got pregnant after one of those nights. And at that time, she seriously thought about giving up the child. And suddenly, I understood that that child, the one she didn't want, that mistake, that was me. For me, being a mom was one of the greatest joys in my life. I wanted to feel you growing inside of me and then meet you and live all that, the whole experience. And writing was the same. I really wanted to do it, and then I actually did. I wanted these things. I, I bore them and I cherished them. But I struggled with them, too, because I was scared. I had doubts, but really, most of all, I had this... Mm, lingering feeling that maybe I shouldn't have been there. And when I lost you and writing had lost its meaning, that feeling came back with a vengeance. This feeling, this knowledge that whatever I do, it is not enough. hard to be a good parent when you're a damaged adult. You become responsible for a life. That requires courage, confidence, and a lot of nerve. And it's really easy to get it wrong. What does that mean? Uh, how can I explain? For the first few months of your life, you were like an extension of me. You couldn't talk, you couldn't walk, you could barely see, actually. And I was feeding you out of my own body. Yuck. Yeah, yuck. Having your life in my hands. That funny feeling. That's what being a mom was all about to me. And then one day... You got sick. It just looked like a cold at first. Alex would wash your nose twice a day with saline. Pulling neon yellow snot tentacles out of your nose amused him no end. I couldn't do it. Then, things got worse. One Friday night, I was alone with you. You started having difficulty breathing. You were in the living room, stacking wooden cubes, and I just kept staring at your chest. You were struggling to get enough air into your lungs. I tried copying your breathing, and I got woozy. It set my head spinning. So, what did you do? I grabbed my phone and called our doctor. I told him I didn't care what time it was, that I needed to come at once. I felt really guilty that it had taken me that long. I hadn't wanted to disturb him. I was so scared, scared that you were going to die. And when I got to the doctor's office, I was a mess. The doctor asked me what was wrong with you, and I said that you were having difficulty breathing, and he was so calm. Oh, he made me want to smash his teeth in. He asked me to put you down on the examination table and take your shirt off so he could listen to your breathing. And when he got close to you with his stethoscope... What happened? <sighs> you beat on him. <laughs> Excuse me? This beautiful golden stream. A perfect arc from your hoo-ha to his coat. <laughs> Awkward. Well, you didn't mind at the time. You were chirping and staring at him. And he said, Well, this little girl looks perfectly healthy. And I started crying. Well, yeah. You must have been relieved. I thought so at the time. But it was more than that. I can see it now. The most important part of being a parent, and also the hardest lesson to learn. You need to trust your children. Trust them to pee on doctors? <laughs> trust them to live. You weren't there so I could feel like a good mother. You were there to live your life, to become yourself. Seems obvious, doesn't it? But I didn't see it. So I spent a lot of my time feeling guilty. 
Telling myself that I didn't deserve you. What? I don't believe it. I was your biggest fan, you know? Really? Of course. You were relentless. You even found the time to work on your scripts. You were working your ass off to make your stories amazing while you were busy taking care of me. How did you manage to be strong like that? I mean, your father was there as well. I know! Imagine! Two kids at home! Oh, come on! Mom, you know I love Dad with all my heart. But in my view, he probably regards mental fortitude as a kind of superpower. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was really hard. I almost gave up so many times. My career wasn't going where I wanted, certainly not as fast as I wanted, but I held on. You gave me so much energy. I presume I took a lot too. Of course, sweetie. I often wish you had an off switch, especially when I saw my face in the mirror the next morning. But that was just a detail. Every morning was magical. I'd grab you in my arms. You'd smile back. You trusted me. I had no more doubt. No more questions. I knew exactly who I was. No one had ever looked at me that way. What an incredible gift. It's just a shame you spent your best years writing for soap opera. <laughs> wow. You do a great Marie impression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm better now, you know? It still hurts like hell. But I get it. I can survive this. On a good day, I can even convince myself that it could be worse. You might have been a goth teenager. What's a goth? Well, I could show you a couple pictures of 14-year-old me. Unfortunately, I think they all got destroyed in a fire or something. Ooh, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> You've taught me all of this. You helped me open doors inside myself. That's what allowed me to grow. Of course, I'll go on without you. I have to. But it's really, really sad. How does the movie end? What movie? The Eternal Sunshine of... Um, whatever. <laughs> no. Well, Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet meet again. And since they don't remember each other, they fall in love again. But then they find old recordings of them saying horrible things about each other. And? Do they split up again? No. They decide to experience their relationships again because they want to recapture the good memories. Even though they know that it's going to hurt them. I loved that ending. I know what you mean. I understand why you're sad, Mom. But you can't be sad forever. It doesn't help you, and it doesn't help me. Life's short enough as it is. Why waste any more time? Do you think it's that easy? That I can just press a button and pow? You can be so egotistical sometimes. Excuse me? Where do I fit into all this? But I was just... So what? I'm going to be a bad memory for the rest of your life? A distressing thought inside your head? Do you even realize what that means? I'm scared. Oh, what are you scared of, my little phone? I'm scared that I'll disappear. But you're already dead. That's not the point. I'm talking about disappearing from here. This is the only place where I still exist. Just here. But I don't want to be this rusty nail that's killing you by degrees. You do realize that that's not me at all? You do know that if you keep at this, I'm not going to exist anywhere. Anymore. You don't have to do this to me, Mom. You don't have to do this to yourself. How much longer do I have to make you miserable? I know you don't deserve that, my little dear. It's all my fault. 
Stop it, Mom. Just stop. You're stuck on repeat. I know that this can be easy to process. And I know that the truth hurts. But right here, right now, you're gonna have to remember. Really. I'm not sure what you mean. What are you talking about? Astrid? Astrid! She's right. Of course she's right. I need to remember now. It's time. I think I'm ready. That's it. I remember now. Not everything, but... You could at least crack a window. All that rain will the whole front. It had just rained. The road was wet and slippery. Ah, shit, I can't drive with these heels on. I didn't sleep all night. I, I can't focus. I also... I was exhausted. Stressed out. In no condition to drive. I was nervous about meeting with my producer. Mom, what for the deer? I don't know why I didn't see the deer earlier. My mind must have been elsewhere. When I heard your warning, my first thought was to avoid hitting it. They were your favorite animal. So I swerved and we ran off the road. And then... Oh, what? doing my little phone playing with grandma's dollhouse what game i'm playing you when you weren't a mom yet can i play i'll be alex hey cutie you come here often hi do you want a baby oh this is moving a bit fast uh, what the heck let's make the best little girl on earth of course she'll be the best <laughs> how do you know well i'm the one making her in my belly so <laughs> talking to you was intoxicating Every time you opened your mouth, I was expecting the unexpected. I loved the way that your little brain continually managed to make sense of the world. But that day, the most astonishing thing was your assurance. How on earth did you have so much trust in me? I'm June. I can't believe it. I'm going to be a dad. We're going to be parents. When I got your picture, I yelled so loud. I think three guys here had a stroke. I'm just unable to focus on work. I'm so happy. <laughs> it feels so... I feel like it's going to... to change my life. I mean... No, I mean, it's going to change me. Like, i never be the same again. I can't wait. And, and you, what do you think? I think you should take the afternoon off and come home. Oh, okay. But why? Is there an emergency? Do you need me? I don't need you. But I am wondering what it's like to have sex with a dad. Uh, uh, <laughs> wow, what a weird thing to say. I'm on my way. He was right, you know, your dad. When you arrived, he changed to his core. Before you were born, he was always a bit lost, a bit wandering through his own life. But from the day you showed up, it was as if everything had become clear for him, as if he finally understood what he was doing here. Hey. 
Listen to me, Junon. You and Alex brought an extraordinary little girl into this world. Astrid was our sunshine. She gave us all a lot of light all through her tiny life. You were able to make such a being because you have it in you. The sun. And the sun never goes out. It shines. So hang on. And shine bright. I know you can. I... I'm proud of you. You and Marie have a connection that's... peculiar. You used to spend hours in her shop watching her paint. She loved that you were so curious. She smiled at you, explained stuff to you. She asked for your opinion about her work. Can you imagine? When I was four years old, I wasn't even allowed in her damn workshop. But you had something inside of you that completely changed her. Actually, I think this is what saved me that day. The idea that even Marie could be touched by a ray of sunlight. There had to be one out there for me, too. It might be the right time for me to admit it, my little fawn. You don't have magical powers. You never had any. You didn't put us under a spell. Not Marie, nor your dad or I. It's easy to hide behind the fact that your being there made everything else possible. And to convince ourselves that you're not being there is forever locking us out of being happy. But that's not true. The seeds that allowed us to change were always inside of us. Sure, they were buried deeply. But they couldn't wait to grow. And you, you were simply an incredible, a, a wonderful beam of sunlight. You don't have to do this to me, Mom. You don't have to do this to yourself. How much longer do I have to make you miserable? My little fawn, I can't do this to you. I don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive myself for what happened, but you've brought too much light in my life for me to reduce you to that. What is that? <sighs> Mom, what do you mean by that? Do you know what I mean? I do, but I'm not sure you do. So I'm going to need you to say it. What is that? <laughs> the accident. It was an accident. Yes, it was an accident, Mom. I lived a life full of joy and laughter and vibrating plastic lightsabers. You shouldn't ever have found that. And it wasn't a lightsaber. You think I don't know that? <laughs> <laughs> I lived a great life full of love. I will always love Dad, Marie, Diane, and you for everything you've given me. For the cozy spot that you made for me in your lives. And then one day, there was an accident. It was an accident. Say it again. It was an accident. An accident. A disaster. 
A calamity. There's nothing to forgive. It's not your fault. You know that, right? Deep down. Do I? Then why do I feel all this guilt? Yeah. That's another mystery. You're angry. But are you sure that you're angry at yourself, Mom? I don't know. I believe in you. You'll figure it out. And when you do, you'll make the right decision. I think you're ready now. I'm ready. Thank you, little Fawn. Thank you for your help. You can leave now. I've got this. I know. I love you very much, Mom. Me too, Astrid. I love you very, very much. I know you'll always be with me. I can feel you are here, and it gives me strength. And I'm going to need a lot of that if I'm going to go in there. But Marie needs me, and we have a lot to talk about. I guess I should have asked the doctor to give me a little something before I went into this room. You don't get free samples of benzos every day. All right, Gino. Cut the bullshit. Hi, Marie. Sorry I made you wait. I had to sort out a few things. A lot of things. But anyway... You knew I was coming eventually, didn't you? You've always had this weird gift of knowing what we're about to do before we even think about doing it. Once again, you were right. I'm here. But I almost didn't come in. I was close earlier, but I just stood outside the door. I was angry at you. I don't even know why. I mean, you're not exactly the warmest mother in the world, still. Why are things so complicated between us? Why do I always feel so... ...threatened when I'm around you? <laughs> Come on... ...a crucifix? You! Wait, is it...? I remember now... ...I've seen this before... ...was that last night? Oh shit, no, it's... Uh, it's all hazy. Ah, uh, hold on. What's that around your neck? Is that a cross? This? It's a childhood keepsake. I found it in my stuff a while back. What? Were you a choir girl or something? It's a bit more complicated than that. I'm listening. Please, you never told me anything about your youth. Ugh. Oh, what the heck? After all, why not? That might do me good. And... I owe you that. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Just... Shut your mouth, pour me a glass of wine, and listen. We used to live in a small village in the east. Grey, boring, and hideous. People were dumb and mean, always keeping tabs on others to tear them down. And of course, these fakers were in church all the time. I spent years in that cesspool, never asking questions. When I was 14, let me tell you, Jesus was my best friend. I would tell him about everything I did wrong in my head. And let me tell you, I was a terrible kid. Nausea, ill-behaved, always running around. 
a tiny devil. And also, I had this desire and fire in my chest. Nasty thoughts. But I really thought that he loved me as I was. Back then, I had three sources of comfort. Jesus, books, and drawing. So I spent an insane amount of time sketching in the neighborhood churches. It was a disease. Everything I laid eyes on had to end up on a sheet of paper. At least then, people left me alone. Otherwise, let me tell you that I never got a minute of peace family with four kids living in a two-room apartment, so I looked after them, washing them, doing their homework. I was the oldest, seven years ahead of my oldest brother. Those little ones were like my own kids. My mother had too much work. At least, while I was taking care of them, I didn't have those weird desires. My dad always had a steak on his plate when he got home. Every night. My mother used to say that he deserved it, working his ass off at the mill for us. But one night, I was still awake when he came home. He was completely shit-faced. He was living in the fallen world. The steel industry was his life, but his life had no tomorrow. So he drank. That night, he looked at me. Weird. I didn't understand. I felt guilty. We were two peas in a pot, my aunt and I. She was the whore in the family. She didn't want to settle. She didn't want kids. She had escaped to live the crazy life in Paris. Freedom. The exact opposite of my mother. One time, she told me something about my mom and dad. Something that blew everything else up. There was an evening dance. He was 19, and she was 15. According to my aunt, he was a bit tipsy. He brought her into a small clearing, and there... He... forced her. They had to get married in a hurry after that, when they learned that my mother was pregnant. Pregnant... with me. My mother always worked her butt off. She would work one factory job after the other, then clean up rich folks' homes. I used to think she was the bravest person in the world, and the strongest. Of course, she had her own temper. She would get into these screaming matches sometimes, and she would drink too, but I was convinced that I could trust her. out with some girlfriends and boyfriends. We only went to the movies, but she lectured me. You're bringing shame on this family, she said. People at church are talking. Something bad's gonna happen to you if you keep tempting men. I answered that if it ever happened to me, I, for one, wouldn't marry my abuser. She hit me. For the first time. She hit me again later. I was getting slapped around because she hated her life. I was blaming her for not fighting back. I wasn't going to let her treat me like this. The day after, it felt like a spell was broken. The church stank. The sculptures were ugly. And the <laughs> male-dominated Jesus stuff made me sick. You don't love me, I whispered to him. Bastard. At that very moment, and that, let me tell you, that's something I'll never forget. The Christ started to bleed.
had my first period right after my tantrum at the church. I was already 14 years old. Pretty late. But then, my body started to develop. The more my body changed, the more my father scared me. Hell, he terrified me. Not just because he was domineering and brutal. It was uncomfortable even being in the same room as him. He was always watching me, commenting on my clothes. I felt like a piece of meat. The last time she raised her hand to me, she hit me so hard, my nose started bleeding. We were having another fight about one of my outings. By that time, I was going out for real, just to spite her. You know me. She called me a harlot, so I bit back. At least I'm not gonna stick with the first guy who knocks me up. I didn't have time to finish saying it. Whack, she slapped the shit out of me, and she spit out. If it were up to me, you're the one I would have dumped. It's stupid, but that struck me right in the gut. And that's when it came up, boiling. The rage. I tasted blood in my throat. I couldn't think straight. My ears started ringing. I felt a shot running through my body. And then I... And it was over. I couldn't walk it back. This cross is the only thing I had left from her, you know? I took it when I left home that very night. I stole it from her. I don't know why I took it. I used to do that a lot back then. Steal stuff. But I'm happy I did it. It gives me a chance to think about her. To remember never to be like her. You see, I'm always telling you to face things head on. But that day, I left. I met with my aunt in Paris, with just a few cents in my pocket. I never saw them again. Not her. Not him. Not the kids. And I never turned back. You hear, Miss Kivas? Shh, don't tell me you fell asleep. Ugh, what a disaster. You really can't handle your booze. Don't worry, daughter. I will still be there tomorrow, and the next day too. There to tell you again what you already know. People are ugly, let me tell you. They're dangerous, all of them. That's just the way things are. It's inside them, the evil in. We need to defend ourselves, stay vigilant. That's how I got out of it. Jen gets it. I think. But you, darling. <sighs> You're too weak. You want to trust people. You want to have faith. But I told you many times. You can't trust anyone. Ever. You don't need me to tell you that. Life's unfair. That's just how it is. So this is what your life was like. You don't let anyone love you. Anytime I think about how it must have been for you, it's increasingly obvious how lucky I was to have Astrid. Every second of my life I spent with her was filled with happiness. You never got to have that. Not as a daughter, nor as a mother. But how could I forget what you told me last night? I mean, I wasn't all there. Too little sleep and too much wine. But for the first time in your life, you open up a little and I nod off. It's absurd. As if... As if I didn't want to hear it. Was it that I was angry that you waited so long before telling me? Or was it something else? 
Something I didn't want to look in the face until now? Paintings are magnificent, but how do you do it? Oh, well, that's hard to put into words. Usually I have a theme in my head, a topic I'm obsessed with, and all of a sudden, everything becomes clear. The shapes, the colors, they fight their way through my brain. Kind of like visions. And then I simply must paint. I can't control it. In fact, if I didn't paint in that moment, I could flip, do crazy things. While Diane and I were dancing, I could hear Marie doing her spiel for Sasha. I'd heard it a hundred times. The visions, uh, what she called her mystical experience. A whole load of crap. Ten minutes later, I set the kitchen on fire, blinded by the urgency, as if my body was overriding my brain. Just goes to show you. As much as I hate it, she might have been telling the truth about her process. I guess I work like that too. doesn't work in my relationship with Marie. The fact that she would lie to me because she doesn't believe I'd be able to face the truth. The fact that she doesn't trust me to deal with it. over there, in the tank. Are they still alive? Uh, of course. The true connoisseurs prefer to cook their lobsters at the last minute. And I'll take them. Uh, absolutely, miss. Do you want one or two? I want them all. I mean, um, there's about two dozen in there. Did you win the lottery or something? I'll need one of your coolers, too, for the road. I drove to the ocean, opened the box, and threw them back in the sea. Freeing them was pointless. Laughable, even. But it felt amazing. I was able to change things. I could reject the fact that it is what it is. Just say no. What's the point in being alive if everything's already been decided for us? For Marina. It's not like that, Alex. Like what? I don't know. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I left you to run back to my overbearing mother's clutches. No, you're wrong. I'm, it's not, that's not it. It's, I'm... I'm well aware that you don't need your mother. She's the one who needs you. 
For a moment there, I thought Alex was out of his mind. Marie leaving me? can't believe how much Astrid loved that house. Why are you surprised? It's awesome. Really? Well, yeah. Have you looked at it up close? There's all these little intricate details. You can open the doors, move the furniture, turn on the lights. Marie must have spent a lot of time on it. I don't know. I think it's an awesome present. When Alex said that, I was reminded about my mobile. Just like the house, it was magnificent, intricate, exquisite. I believe that's why I kept it in my room for so long, hanging above my bed. These two presents were the two singular proofs that Marie cared for us. That was her way of saying she loved us. Thank you for the mobile. I can't believe you managed to find it. Oh, it's nothing. Do you want to stay for a bit? Coffee, maybe? No, thank you. I gotta go. I have uh, a meeting. A meeting? Yeah, a thing. Don't worry about it. Say hi to Alex for me. Oh, I'll call him. He's just in the next room. Oh, hi, Alex. Bye, Alex. Done. Gotta go. I rarely saw Marie being ill at ease, but the few times it did happen was when she came to the house to visit when Astrid was born. It was as if she felt like she was intruding on our family, maybe because she didn't know what it was like having one. is for sure on this wretched earth a single thing it's that you don't need to thank me for anything i'll see you monday at the studio i found that really weird at the time this whole exchange first of all marie saying beautiful things sounding more loving than ever before but on top of that her almost scolding me for thanking her as if extraordinary circumstances had forced her out of her self-imposed duty to bully me, and that she was having a hard time coming to terms with it. Her daughter. Remarkable. <laughs> but you don't look anything like her. Do you paint as well? No, 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 I don't. I'm more of a... <laughs> of course you don't. <laughs> Why would you, with such a talented mother around? I've never felt like I'm competing with Marie. My love for the movies, my penchant for writing. I did it all for myself, without thinking about her. But perhaps she was actually feeling threatened, as if the creative process was uniquely hers, her exclusive domain. Is 
isn't news to you. It's unfair, but that's how it is. You didn't choose to be my daughter. I didn't choose to be my mother's daughter. I could blame it on God, but that would be giving him too much credit. I don't know who's to blame, really. I do know that it's unavoidable, though. And Astrid, she didn't choose us either. She wasn't supposed to be part of this family. At first, I thought that she could be the one to break the cycle, but in the end, the curse got her too, and it hit again. Harder. My shitty curse. Stifling hot in there. Yeah, sorry, AC's broke. Get in, we're running late. Don't sit on my script. You could at least crack a window. All that rain brought a cold front. Mima, Mima, Mima. Oh, sweetheart. How are you doing? You look great today. I'm a princess, the computer princess. That is so special. Can we get going? All right, all right. We have time. I don't. I need to drop off Astrid at Minas, and then I have a meeting at the production office to show my... Just start the car. That will teach me to ask you for a special favor. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the third special favor this week, Marie. Just go. In great. <sighs> Shit, I can't drive with these heels on. Why are you even wearing these things? Ah, uh, silly me. Just dressing up for a business meeting. <laughs> Sweetie, what present did you bring for Mina? A Clay-Doh pizza factory. I love pizza. You look really flushed, dear. Are you too hot? Let me take your coat off. Marie, what on earth are you doing? Just for one second. Forget it. Sit down. We're almost there. Just watch the road. You sit I'm down almost... right now. Stop that. You are worse than a traffic cop. Watch it, my script! You're still writing for this garbage? Damn, Scavus. You might have the lowest self-esteem I've ever seen, but I must admire your perseverance. No one asked for your opinion. I didn't sleep all night. I, I can't focus. Also, also, I'm too old for this. Okay, I'm taking off my coat now. Anyway, sounds like you're not yet too old to be a mediocre writer. Marie, please. This is too much praise. I have to prod you some way or another. You are so incredibly lazy. <laughs> and they keep coming. All these flowers. Really, I can't. Nothing ever comes easy to women in this industry. I had to build it all myself. No one was there to help me. I slept four hours a night when you were born. I worked all the time to provide for your needs. Oh, you really gave me everything, Marie, except perhaps... Self-esteem? Oh, and the father. You're not making sense, June. You and your sister would be nothing without me, and you know it. You're both churlish and fearful. I gave you everything, and you're just squandering it all to write soap operas. Maybe you'd be a better writer if you had had to toil a little bit more. Who knows? Mom! I need help with the... Uh, with the thingy. Uh, what's that, my little phone? Sure, just... Change the subject. I am not changing the subject. We weren't talking. <sighs> what am I supposed to say when you get mad like this? I get mad because I believe in you. Stop yelling. We're not yelling, sweetheart. Anyway, this little one is only one thing you've done well. Speaking of which, if we could but avoid... But if you're mishandling her the way you fucked up your career, that's concerning. Children are delicate. They need protection. You can put even the best child in a shitty family. They're gonna blow up. Wait, why are you even saying that? What are you talking about, exactly? I... I made some mistakes with you two, it's true. But we turned out okay in the end, didn't we? Whatever you think... You don't get it. There's something hanging above our heads. All of our heads. Something that's about to fall on our heads if we're not careful. It's been there forever. Passed from one woman onto the next in our family. Like a disease. Are you sick, Mimo? No, sweetie, she's not sick. This is grown-up talk. You're right, Jun. Love. 
love of self. It's true, I don't think I told you that. But I think that's because no one told me either. Or my mother. Oh, okay, and so you're... scared for Astrid. Oh, hold on. You, Marie, the great Marie de Mange, you believe in that nonsense? There's no curse on our heads. Next time I'll keep my mouth shut. Unless you keep it open, actually. I know hardly anything about your life. Not a thing, but I do realize that you had a hard time. And that you're scared. <laughs> I'm not scared. I think you are. You're scared will turn out like you. But we can change. Everyone can change. <laughs> My dear daughter, I'm not sure about that. Do you think so? I know so. And that's all thanks to you. You taught us that in your own twisted, painful way, but still, I did what I could. And in the end, you did give us the means to change things. You've taught us how we could blow off the entire world and do whatever we wanted. That's your way of showing love, don't you think? Love isn't my thing. Oh, Mom, come on. You love me and I know it, in spite of your best efforts to hide it. I can feel it, and I love you. And I love you too, Mimo. Oh, <laughs> thank you, dearest. Makes me so happy to hear you say that. Why are you not in your seat? What are you doing standing up? Marie, why is Astrid completely unlatched? She was sweating. I just took off her sweater. No Shit, big deal. I told you to keep her safety belt on. Are you kidding me? You know, you're so uptight sometimes. Unbelievable. I am not uptight. I would just like Mom, you to... Mom, watch for the deer! Was you? You knew, didn't you? The fight, the, the unlatched safety belt. I'm sure you remembered, and you didn't say anything. You just hung me out to dry with my feelings of guilt. That's it. That's the real reason. That's why I was so mad at you. I'm sure that's also why you filled in this stupid paper with my name on it. You probably thought that if anything happened to you, it would be some kind of divine justice. I would have a choice of what to do with you. And now I have to make the decision. So what am I supposed to do, Marie? Maybe we could invent something else. We deserve that. Why would I make my peace with you? I could agree to play by your rules one last time. I can't give you what you want. Not this time. I refuse to take on this responsibility. If Jan feels like taking care of it, uh, good for her. I'm tired of your crooked schemes, your poison chalices. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. But don't go imagining things either. I don't want you to die. In fact, I was hoping you would live through this. That you would come back cognizant enough to think about what you've done. And that it would make you suffer. For a long time. You'll never see me again. I'm sorry, I can't look you in the eyes to tell you this. And yet... That's exactly how things have always been between us. Adieu, Marie.
to the park. And we will. Just give me five more minutes, will you? Mom! <laughs> all right, all right, Achille. Here we go. At last! Are you happy with your story? I think so. Fine. You'll read it to me later? Mm, I'm not sure. It's not really a story for kids. And... I want to trade the red stegosaurus today. Did you know his tail is actually a slide? Really? Can I try it too? Only if we buy ice cream on our way back. Seems like a fair deal to me. You know, Marie... I figured out what you're missing. You've been fuming inside for years because... You have no hope. But no one can live like this. Not really. I need hope. That you'll be okay. That you will heal. That life will go on. And maybe even one day... You and I can talk. Really talk. About everything. And if, unfortunately, things don't turn out that way... ...if you were to die... ...at least we'll have had this. Hope that things change. Hope to change. I'm not forgiving you, Marie. As Astrid would say... ...there's nothing to forgive in an accident. The only one I want to forgive is myself. I forgive myself for my failures. For not believing in myself for so long. I'm sorry I had such a hard time realizing how strong I am. In my own way. I have the strength to live. I even have the strength to help you live if it comes to that. And with some help from the people who love us, you and I can heal. Yes, 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 I know, I know, I know. Just a little more patience. Mom! <laughs> all right, all right, Achille. Here we go. At last! Are you happy with your story? I think so. Fine. You'll read it to me later? Mm, I'm not sure. It's not really a story for kids. And... I want to trade the red stegosaurus today. Did you know his tail is actually a slide? Really? Can I try it too? Only if we buy ice cream on our way back. Seems like a fair deal to me. Very well, Marie. We agree. I'm going to tell the doctor not to take life prolonging measures. That's what you would have wanted. But just so you know, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for Diane. She loves you, you know? She doesn't want you to die. But I don't want you to begrudge her for still being alive. I'm doing this for myself as well. Because I hate you. I hate you for what you did to Astrid. I hate you for my years of defenselessness and anger. And I think I'll never be able to not hate you. I actually understand your fear of not being completely there. I understand it because that's how I've always lived. It's horrible. And it stops today.
I may have gone mute. No, you haven't. Why would you say that? <laughs> oh, so you can actually hear me. <laughs> okay, message received. I'm coming soon. Mom! <laughs> all right, all right, Ashil. Here we go. At last! Are you happy with your story? I think so. Fine. You'll read it to me later? Mm, I'm not sure. It's not really a story for kids. And... I want to trade the red stegosaurus today. Did you know his tail is actually a slide? Really? Can I try it too? Only if we buy ice cream on our way back. Seems like a fair deal to me. 